Mayor, you're on mute. It's quieter that way. Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, September 15th is the irregular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. This meeting is held in accordance with the Brown Act is currently in effect under the State Emergency Services Act, the governor's emergency declaration related to COVID-19 and the governor's executive order N2920 issued on March 17th, 2020 that allows attendance by members of the city council, city staff, and the public to participate and conduct the meeting by video conference. Video conference locations are not open to the public. As some attendees may be participating in their first city council meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I wanted to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. Thus, if you desire to speak to an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council gets to that item. Additionally, we have a section in the agenda called public comments, communications, for which it is the public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communication should not relate to an item that is on the agenda for this evening. When I open the public comment period, use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. This will alert the staff that you have public, a public comment you would like to provide. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and city of residence for the record. As the council is conducting these meetings via video conference and given the COVID-19 pandemic, and the increased number of speakers that may have wanted to make comments on various type items during the meetings and consistent with policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically after two minutes. I'll repeat that. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's web, website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read for the record. To provide a live remote public comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID and password are ID 958-8391-5557. Again, 958-8391-5557. You'll need the password of 114313. 114-313. Should you choose not to provide comments but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in a couple of ways. You can try live to visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel. Cable broadcast Comcast 28 for incorporated Walnut Creek only, Rossmore channel 26, Wave channel 29, and ATTU verse channel 99. It is also live streamed on our website. At this time, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Francois? Here. Councilmember Silva? Here. Councilmember Waddell? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wilk? Here. And Mayor Haskew? Here. Next on the agenda was to have been a presentation of the Contra Costa Fire Protection District. Unfortunately, this presentation will need to be rescheduled. Chief Aaron McAllister of the Contra Costa Fire Department has been deployed to Mendocino area in support of the fires there last week and will not be able to make it back for tonight's meeting. 
we will look forward to reschedule in the near future. And we thank the Contra Costa Fire Department for their service. It is our delight next um, to uh, call Chair Michelle Alice Alas. Um, pardon me. Um, please let me know how you pronounce your name. Uh, we'll provide a brief presentation about the Youth Youth Commission. Hi there. My name is Michelle Alas. Please try to ignore my virtual background. I was in another Zoom meeting and I forgot to change it. Um, <laughs> but hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Alas and I am the outgoing chair of the Walnut Creek Youth Leadership Commission. Good evening to all of the council members, Mayor Haskew, and all the members of the public. Thank you so much for having me here. For those of you who don't know, the Youth Leadership Commission is comprised of 15 high school students from all across Walnut Creek. We are the avenue towards increasing youth involvement in our community and in our local government. Students are not alienated from civic engagement. On the contrary, we are at the forefront of the biggest fights of our lives, from climate change to gun violence to racial inequity. This powerful, dedicated group of students devotes many hours of our time per week to augment youth civic engagement. I am proud to have been able to serve as chairperson this past year and even prouder of what we will accomplish this coming term. We were busy this past year. We started off with a pre-voter registration drive where we were able to register 55 new voters in, at the high school level. While our plan had been to carry this out throughout the term, unfortunately the pandemic derailed that sentiment, but that does not mean that the Youth Commission stopped. Since COVID-19 hit back in March, the Youth Commission continued our bi-weekly meetings totaling around 10 Zoom meetings throughout the summer. We launched a stay-at-home campaign on social media to encourage young people to social distance and finished editing our cultural awareness video, which featured some commissioners, including myself, making some yummy pupusas from El Salvador. We even wrote some letters to seniors at the Tiffany Court of Walnut Creek so that the senior community knew that we were thinking of them in these trying times. Now with the new term starting, we are eager to welcome four new commissioners who you will meet today to our family and are excited to incite more tangible change. Coming up, we are partnering with the Arts Commission and the Community Arts Foundation to launch a community mural in the alley behind Maine as part of the Rebound program. Applications for youth artists are currently open, so if you want to contribute towards uplifting our beautiful city, please visit the Walnut Creek Youth Leadership Commission city website for the application. Thank you, Council, for supporting each of our endeavors. And thank you to my wonderful commissioners for making my term as chair a year I will never forget. Have a great night. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. You, thank you for a job well done. It was fun to see you at all the occasions. And um, we really appreciate the old commission members. And we're really looking forward to the new ones. So thank you for all you did. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing four new commissioners this evening to you, Council. Um, we had a very competitive process um, this year. We had about 40 applications for five spots um, on the commission. So the folks you are meeting tonight are the best of the best. Um, I will say uh, one of the highlights of my, my job is working with these um, young future leaders of the Walnut Creek community. And each application was a pleasure to read. We have a lot of engaged um, youth in this community and um, all are very committed in, to staying engaged, um, even if they're not even on the commission. Um, so um, not sure who wants to start, but um, each one of our new commissioners will introduce themselves to you um, so you can get to know them. Hi, good evening to all of you. My name is Rebecca Joseph and I'm a sophomore at Los Lomas High School and I'm honored to be given the opportunity to speak tonight. I just recently became a part of the Walnut Creek Youth Commission, yet even though I've only known the people working with me for a short amount of time, I'm amazed at the passion and drive I feel radiating from the Zoom screen. Now, my story in the world of politics is, has been crazy, and honestly, I never saw myself getting into this field until my freshman year of high school, where I joined the school's speech and debate team. As I was thrown into this foreign world of speech and debate, I broadened my knowledge of the world of law and politics as I fell more and more in love with the Saturday morning tournaments. 
in the spring when I saw the youth commission applications through Instagram, I was brought back to my last year of middle school when I went on the sister cities youth exchange trip and our group had just got back from Nocetto, Italy, and we were speaking to the board about our experiences. I remember at the city council event, there were members of the youth commission talking about the change they were able to bring to this community. It was amazing to see how connected we were then and now during these unprecedented times, it's important more than ever that we as a community and as teams stay connected while still raising our voices. As my friend Dina M, who is part of the commission today says, we, start, we see parts of the community that others may not. And we as a youth commission have and are inspiring others to speak for change. And those words have really res resonated with me because through the last few meetings with the commission, it has led me to cherish my voice and I can't wait for this year with them. Thank you. Thank you and next please. I can go. Yes. Hi, I'm Arjun Desange. I'm a sophomore at North Key High School. I was actually really excited when I heard about the Youth Commission because I was not aware that there was a platform for youth such as myself to participate in our city's government and to help improve our community. Mm. I feel really privileged to be able to participate on this commission. And I think that especially during these hard times, we can continue to help on the Creek make a, be a, be a better place. And with the help of my fellow commissioners, I hope to do that. Well, I really hope to get to know them better. Thank you. Thank you. Colin, would you be next, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Colin Bosley. I'm a junior at Northgate High School. And um, personally, I am a, a member of Mali United Nations, as well as Junior State of America. I'm really interested in political science. And um, in the future, I'd like to um, run for local office sometime. Uh, and that kind of that's kind of part of what uh, drew me to the youth commission. Um, and I was also really interested in participating in the community and getting a chance to meet some really important people who do a lot of really important things. And uh, specifically on the commission with blood drives and uh, voter registration and information campaigns, um, just those small things that can really make a huge difference in the community. Um, I think that it was really important for me to give back to my community has given so much to me and uh, I just think this is a really great opportunity uh, for me to help the community as well as for me to get really valuable experience that's going to help me later on in my life. Thank you Colin and Alexandra. Wonderful if you'd go next. Hi good, e good evening everyone. I'm Alexandra and I'm a freshman at Contra Costa School of Performing Arts. I'm really excited to be on the Youth Commission and help set up Walnut Creek for a more sustainable, diverse, and equitable future. At my school, I get to meet people from all over, and I've learned new ways to celebrate diversity and encourage others to share their opinions and voices. I really value creativity, and I'm really happy Wanna Creek is continuing to host online arts classes and encouraging artistic and creativity at home. I love to make art such as watercoloring and working backstage for my school's plays when we are in person. I also really enjoy swimming, spending time with my friends and family, and meeting new people. I can't wait to learn more about the inner workings of city government and aid Walnut Creek in being even more eco-friendly. I'm excited and ready to share my voice and hope to leave a positive and long lasting impact on Walnut Creek. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, thank you both and all, through, all four of you and welcome. Uh, we're looking forward to see you live up to your aspirations, which I'm sure you will. And uh, good luck this year. And remember you still have to study. Don't forget school. Thank you very much for being here. Um, do any of the other council members want to add to the comments? Looks I, like you've, oh, well, yeah. Just, just briefly, okay, thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for stepping up. This, uh, it does take time, it is important. And as Michelle and a few others can attest, I have had uh, meetings with uh, several different youth commissioners from time to time regarding issues that are happening in the schools and throughout our community. So it is absolutely something that I value and you should all as well. I look forward to working with you for the next year. Uh, Cindy, please. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, I just want to acknowledge, well, thank you for joining the Youth Commission, congratulations, but I want to acknowledge the entire commission. This past summer, we were distributing information 
to in different neighborhoods around the census and some of your fellow commissioners stepped up and with masks on and gloves helped distribute helped us distribute about 6000 handouts so thank you to all of them and Michelle please pass that on on uh, my behalf thank you going once council members going twice Thank you, and we're on to the consent calendar. Enjoy. Next on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does any council member wish to pull an item for discussion? Seeing none, uh, does any member of the public wish to make a comment on an item on the consent calendar? If so, um, please raise your hand um, or press nine if you're on the audio if you would like to provide public comment. As a reminder, every speaker only has two minutes to make their oral comments. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have, have been and will post, be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I will ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Mayor, I don't see any um, hands raised for public comment. Thank you. Oh. Um, oh, we, what? We have one. <laughs> Alrighty. I was trying to go a little slower to let them um, raise their hands. So we have Joshua Ferrer. All right. Hi, sorry, and I may have cashed in. Is this general public comment or for the consent calendar? It's the consent calendar, Josh. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. All right, since I believe we are now clear, City Clerk, is that true? We are good. We are Mayor, good, okay. Mayor, I'm happy to make the motion to move to adopt the six items, uh, eight items of the consent calendar items, A through H. Okay. Have a motion and a second. May I please have the roll call vote? Councilmember Silva? Aye. Councilmember Francois? Aye. Councilmember Waddell? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Wilk? Aye. And Mayor Haskew? Aye. Motion carries. Next, we're on to the public communications part of the agenda. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comments on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. Does anybody in public wish to provide public comments? Please use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're audio only. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral comments. The Zoom feed will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At the this time, I ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who wish to make comment. We do have members of the public wishing to comment, so we'll go ahead and bring them in. We have David Harder coming in first. Thank you. David, do you know you're on mute? David? Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? We can now, thank you. Can you hear me? We can now, yes. Oh, thank you so much for your patience. You're welcome. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is David Harder, a 30 year resident of Walnut Creek. I have a suggestion about police reform. Over the past 12 years, several cities have added social workers to their police departments. 
These social workers help officers de-escalate mental health crises, domestic violence, and substance abuse. I have provided news articles to the city clerk with statistics that describe how social workers benefit the police in practice. Social worker education and training helps them divert cases away from the criminal justice system and toward the help they need. For example, a licensed clinical social worker in California has a master's degree plus 3,200 hours of supervised training, far more than any supervised or uniform officer could be expected to have. These articles make a convincing case, and I hope you will consider this option moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Michael Sampson. Thank you. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello, um, so I'm gonna speak about um, actually something that I was just, I'm kind of curious about because I haven't heard anything about it, but I've read articles, um, which is that there's a G League Warriors franchise coming to Walnut Creek. I saw articles about this coming out about a month ago and I thought it was really cool because I'm a Warriors fan and, um, and I haven't heard anything about it. So I just kind of wanted to know sort of if there's any, if you guys have any status updates on that. Um, because if it's true and they are indeed going to be playing in Shadelands, I think we can leverage this opportunity uh, to transform Shadelands, to reimagine Shadelands uh, as a dense, mixed use, vibrant, uh, sustainable new urban district uh, instead of like a corporate office park. Um, so I just want to know sort of what the status is with that because I think we have an awesome opportunity um, to completely reimagine Shadelands if we are indeed moving forward with having a G League Warriors franchise here in Walnut Creek. It's just a cool opportunity. I want to make sure that we're taking advantage of it. Uh, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Next, we have Joshua Ferrer. Hello. Wish I could talk about such a lighthearted theme, but I know my comments last week created a bit of a stir. Um, and I feel it's worth addressing again. And I talked with Justin over an hour about this, um, but black people make up 1.6% of the city's population, but 18% of Walnut Creek PD arrests. As a percentage of the population, black people are 13 times more likely to be arrested than white people. This isn't just Walnut Creek. We see similar statistics, similar race-based disparities, across California, across the country. And these aren't just statistics, they represent actual harm and violence. And they're part and parcel of that system of mass incarceration um, that is largely designed to criminalize and lock up black bodies. We see discrimination across the board too, and how this plays out. And um, who makes 911 calls over suspicious people or behaviors, um, where police choose to patrol, who police stop, how they interact with people in those stops, who they choose to arrest, and through to charges and sentencing. And we see it not only in data, but anecdotally as well, um, of how black children need to be given literally the talk um, because they'll be targeted and treated differently by police from black Walnut Creek residents who have spoken up about how they have been targeted and harassed by Walnut Creek police department uh, officers for being black. And from the fact that the only person killed by the WCPD in the last few years, Miles Hall was black. I am stunned that this disparity has not been mentioned more by Walnut Creek City Councilors. It should be a priority for the council, um, as well as both in the public safety and the diversity and inclusion committees. How can you say Black Lives Matter and then not act to end this disparity? Only one councilor has uh, brought this up recently, Justin Wydell, um, but unfortunately he didn't bring it up to address and fix the disparity. He brought it up to say pretty much that it doesn't matter, to deny the racism that's so clearly the driving factor and to make the insinuation that maybe it's because black people are disproportionately coming into Walnut Creek and causing harm to say that no matter what the data is, systemic racism doesn't exist. To all Walnut Creek city councilors, instead of wasting time denying. 
Our next speaker is Catherine Wally. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening to the council members and to all those in attendance today. I'm Catherine Wally, a resident in Walnut Creek. I ask that the city council ensure that the community is involved in, the, in and provided opportunities for input in the hiring of our new police chief. The position is an incredibly powerful and important one. And given all that is happening in our community and in the world right now, it's essential that we select someone who possesses the ability to establish trust and confidence, develop effective community relationships, create and sustain an ethical organizational structure, and is able to assess and respond to community concerns. Providing opportunities for community input during the hiring process will help ensure that we select a police chief who possesses these qualities. Thank you very much for your time, and I yield my time. Thank you very much. Eric Cox is the next speaker. topic even more so now. Uh, I bring it up mainly because um, in review of the new uh, emergency management plan uh, 2020, um, I don't substantially see anything different in it from 2019 or even going back to 2006 concerning um, wildfire and wildfire danger and uh, methods of uh, educating our public and um, you know, when I look to Lafayette, I look to Moraga, I look to, um, you know, they're, pro they're providing 24 page uh, wildfire preparedness uh, uh, brochures. They have detailed uh, plans uh, in the 52 page booklet for their residents, which include maps, et cetera, uh, how to evacuate. Um, I know that we've all been living under the COVID and uh, many other pressures uh, these last number of months. I know that the emergency uh, management manager, I don't know if you a new one has been hired, but I would hope that Walnut Creek would turn their attention to the extreme danger of wildfire and try to have an outreach program to their residents. In Walnut Creek, in Rossmore, we are led to believe that we can only take directions from the city of Walnut Creek. And, um, you know, when our emergency plan list fire as number seven on a list below dam failure and above ocean flood, whereas Moraga lists wildfire as number one in their concerns, Lafayette has seven members on a, an emergency panel dedicated just to wildfire. I would hope in the future, and I would hope that all uh, members planning to run for office take wildfire as a serious consideration that it is. We can just read the news, look on the television. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Rafferty. Hello. Uh, as the council members know, I've, I've asked that this be agendized. Two minutes is not enough to do it justice. But the most important job you have is to maintain the integrity of elections. And if we have a successful election nationally this year, it will be because of innovations in promoting participation and mail voting that have been pioneered by the legislature and uh, most of the uh, county clerks in our state. Uh, four years ago, I was uh, asked by um, a senior legislator to drive 90 miles back to Wanna Creek because of an incident in a, in a precinct, which I did not really wanna be anything to do with, but a poll worker was insulting apparently every single Democrat who voted as they signed in and he was making threatening statements, uh, kind of bizarre statements at the time that Mr. Trump was gonna be elected president and he was going to get Democratic voters like whoever was registering. This has no place. I didn't, I 
asked, uh, I received information from inside the polling place. I went outside and I called the police. They should have taken statements from the complainants. They did not. And I complained to the mayor the next morning. And again, this was dismissed. I was told I couldn't have a copy of the police report. Uh, I'm very unhappy about this. I think everyone in Walnut Creek should be unhappy about this. It's important. Uh, we're going to have an election and someone will win, someone will lose. But the, everyone should feel that the election was fair. No one should be insulted in the act of voting. And uh, this is uh, obviously a more serious threat than it was four years ago, but it's something that should not happen in Walnut Creek. Thank you, Scott. I agree with you. Would you please have the next speaker? Jenny Schneider. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Jenny Schneider. I'm a resident and business owner in Walnut Creek, and I'm here to speak as one of the community members who watched the candidates panel discussion today and on behalf of justiceformileshall.org. Um, the first question that the panel was asked for people who didn't watch was what have you done and who have you contacted to better understand business issues in Walnut Creek? Great question, but left me wondering, do our current city council members know the community really at all? I personally have attended approximately 31 city council meetings in the past year and a half and have spoken at each meeting. I've introduced myself the same way every time, Jenny Schneider, business owner. In fact, I just celebrated seven years of business in the city of Walnut Creek. Um, this year I was invited and participated in a special city council meeting to address COVID shutdowns and brainstorm ideas to help local businesses. I attended the State of the City luncheon hosted by the Chamber of Commerce. There I was representing not only justiceformileshall.org, but as the founder of a group called Thirsty Thursday. Thirsty Thursday was created approximately five years ago. We are a group of women who own a business in this area. The sole purpose of this group is to support one another and help each other succeed as women in business. Our group consists of about 151 members. And as I was on the meeting this morning, I took a quick poll this morning to see if any of our members had been contacted by anyone currently on the city council. From everyone I heard back from, not one person had been contacted. You can imagine my surprise when I heard this first question and not one of you had reached out to me directly to ask me about business and to maybe have me put together a group of women who run business on a creek. So just real quickly, sorry. Adam Neiman. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I, hello, my name is Adam Neiman. I'm a uh, resident in Walnut Creek, pronouns he, him, his. And I am uh, calling in today. I also attended the um, Walnut Creek Chamber of Commerce uh, panel this morning. And I just wanted to share that I was um, a little bit surprised and a little, a little dismayed by the um, answer to one of the questions about Prop 15 um, by, by uh, the members who are up for re-election who are currently on the, on the city council, um, who all said that they would be against Prop 15. Um, I've actually started phone banking for the first time. I'd never done it before. Um, and I started phone banking for Prop 15 because I really believe that Prop 15 is gonna be a, uh, is a, hopefully it will pass. I think it's a really helpful proposition. Um, it's, of, co of course, Prop 15 is all about uh, investing $12 billion into schools and communities, also known as the School and Community First Act. And uh, this will have the effect of really, I, I'm, I hope, energizing communities uh, from things ranging from potholes to larger community-based resources, like a 24-7 non-police mental health crisis hotline, uh, as well as schools for things that schools need, which especially right now during COVID is, is such a challenge for distance learning. And of course, that would come out of, that $12 billion annually would come out of 
property taxes for large commercial properties, not for homeowners, but for commercial property of three million dollars or more, which I understand can will impact um, some businesses in Walnut Creek because of the 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 fees and the costs for Walnut Creek. But I would just um, I would urge a reconsideration on Prop 15 because I think I I see it as a real opportunity. Um, for investment, particularly in uh, communities and schools that have historically been underinvested, particularly black and brown communities. So I would urge the members who spoke about that earlier to reconsider and for Walnut Creek to take a pro Prop 15. Thank you very much for your time. Next, we have Dan H. Welcome, Dan. All right, can you guys, oh, can you guys see my sign? Yes. It's kind of backwards, but it says justice for Miles Hall. I'll have to work on it for next time. Um, yeah, but Walnut Creek needs a Black Lives Matter flag hanging underneath the American flag. I've talked to Kevin Wilk about this and I, I believe he supports. Um, and then also, we also need a citizen community police review commission. Now they have this commission in Richmond and where the, the, Richmond is the only city in the whole Bay Area, maybe even the state. Uh, Rick Perez, PD Perez's father told me that the other day and he lost his son. He got murdered by a Richmond police department. Um, but yeah, we need a citizen community police review commission, get the, and the Black Lives Matter flag. And then Scott Rafferty, if you're listening, you have to request a police report online from the Walnut Creek Police uh, Department website page. Fill out the form and they're supposed to get back to you with the, with the, um, with the police report. All right. All right, you guys, have a nice night. It's nice talking with you. Black Lives Matter flag, Com Citizen Community Police Review Commission. Let's go. And I will yield, oh, reinvest in community. That's what we needed to do. So we take the money out of the, the, the city um, police budget and then we reinvest that in community. And that Shaven idea that Michael Sampson has brought up, that can you, can you, can you imagine going to a game in Shavens where it's a nice, place to go to and reinvest all that money from the, the $38 million police department and take some money and put it over at the uh, Shaylands for the, for the Warriors. Go Warriors and justice for Miles Hall. Next up, we have Moxie Marsh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Moxie Marsh. I'm a junior at Los Lomas High School. And while I would never um, assert that police is the best form of public safety, I will admit that it is currently the only form of pub public safety that we are afforded uh, widely in our city. And as such, we as the community members here need to play an integral part in choosing who gets to lead that system. As community members, we need to have our voices equally represented in that choice because we are the people who will be protected or not protected by that person. And that means making whatever discussion you have about it, whenever that's talked about, accessible to us, which means maybe not putting it at 9 a.m. on a weekday because then you won't hear student voices because we have school at 9 or not putting it at rush hour because then obviously people who work 9 to 5 maybe won't be able to join. Um, because the accessibility of having our voices heard needs to be wider. Um, and I think that just needs to be reimagined because I know a lot of folks can't normally come to general like public safety meetings that, that one, the one I've been to was at nine in the morning. Um, I didn't know anyone who could go cause they all had work. Um, so I think maybe making those meetings more accessible to the public would be beneficial. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. City Clerk, are there any more? 
You're on mute. I don't see any more speakers. Thank you. I am now closing the public comment and we're moving on to council member and staff announcements and reports on activities or requests. Would uh, the city attorney let us know? Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we have no uh, closed session reports this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Would the city manager have a report? Yeah, good evening, Dan Buckshy, city manager. Just um, uh, two updates in my capacity as the emergency services director for the city. Okay. First is that obviously uh, a record number of fires continue to burn in California. This is uh, the, uh, I guess, the most dangerous fire season, if you will, and that the most acres have burned by far and we're not even to peak fire season. You know, I think we've been fortunate in Walnut Creek in that we've only had to deal with the smoke, which is really the silver lining, because as we know, our air quality has been at uh, unsafe levels for quite some time. We've had spare the air day alerts now for about three weeks. And um, while it's improved here moderately, it continues. Just know that uh, staff continues to work with the county health department and air quality officials to monitor closely. And we have been uh, modifying our operations as needed. Many of our, our pools, our recreational facilities that are open, as well as the golf course have been closed uh, intermittently over the past couple of weeks. Uh, today was the first day they've opened up in, in quite a few because it was at uh, a more moderate level as opposed to at an unhealthy level. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, the worst is behind us and that uh, we will have uh, clear air for quite some time, but I think it's going to be intermittent for quite some time until likely until we receive rains, whenever, whenever that may be. So uh, more to follow on that as conditions change. And then secondly, related to the pandemic, as I spoke about two weeks ago, the state did move to a new system as opposed to having a county watch list. There is a rating system that is, uh, has color ratings from purple, red, orange, yellow, noting that there is not a green intentionally because the state does not see us returning fully to normal anytime soon. Uh, it is anticipated that unless the state changes its direction in the future, that every county would remain in one of those classifications for three weeks at a minimum. And we in Contra Costa County, they are not rating by city, just to clarify it is by county. So we are, we are categorized with the rest of Contra Costa County, even though our numbers have been considerably better than the county as a whole are in the purple or most serious category, which means in order for us to get through yellow, even at the best case at three weeks per color, we're looking at end of the year before we could potentially be in yellow more or less. That assumes there's not a second wave that also assumes that flu season is not bad and does not complicate matters. So I think it's safe to say that we will be living with social restrictions at least until January and likely far beyond uh, discussion I was having earlier this week with someone in the medical field believes that even if there is a vaccine in January, we're looking at likely another 12 months of social restrictions as it will take some time in order to vaccinate everybody and create uh, the herd immunity, if you will, until we can fully lighten all restrictions. Um, that said, I don't have any more detail. I hope that's a worst case uh, and not a best case, but uh, that remains to be seen. We also do continue to monitor our budget closely. We're hoping to get some updated sales tax figures here in the next few days to have greater insight as to what occurred in the April through June timeframe. There is about a three month delay from a sales tax transaction until we receive the data from the states that we can analyze it and truly understand what's occurring in the marketplace. So uh, that said, we do have a, a continue to have protective measures installed at all of our city facilities, such as uh, plexiglass sneeze guards. We do have full uh, personal protective equipment for our employees for both coronavirus and also now for um, smoke related matters with N95 masks. And that, uh, that's all I have this evening, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, council members, council, council member Waddell, do you have anything to share? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the mayor's conference, but I'm assuming that you'll cover that in your- You can talk. Uh, so we had a nice presentation from Mr. Buckshy and 
uh, and of course the, the mayor chimed in about uh, what we're doing for a 24 hour by seven response to mental health care. Um, I don't, was that recorded? I don't know if it's posted on the mayor's conference website. Does anyone know? Is that, it was actually very interesting about all the different options in which are, that are being investigated. And, uh, and the report that was provided was very educational to, I, I believe everyone that was involved. I also had the opportunity to attend the uh, MCE Tech Committee and there really wasn't anything to report, but I will note uh, two specific items. First, we're having our annual board meeting here on Friday, starting at 9 a.m. and we're, we're gonna be talking about a lot of things that have hit us here in the last couple of days, specifically uh, the issues with Cal ISO, shutting down power, et cetera, and then what we're gonna be focusing on in the next year. One thing to note on the, the power outage uh, outages that we have seen, MCA, MCE has been a responsible player in this. We have been able to meet our, our load, but unfortunately not everyone is responsible players. And uh, Cal ISO had made the decision in certain areas of Walnut Creek to shut down power due to the, the uh, power demands. Uh, MCE and myself, and I'm sure all my fellow uh, council members appreciate the conservation efforts that Walnut Creek put into place and really your surrounding communities because it could have been much, much worse than it, than it was. With that, uh, I yield. Thank you. Where did we get that? Uh, Council Member Francois. Thank you, Madam Mayor, along with my colleagues. I also attended the mayor's conference and I will defer to you on giving a fuller update on that. But I, I did want to express my thanks to you for your leadership and getting the item on the agenda and discussed among the mayors and to the city manager for his leadership with the other city managers in, in facilitating that conversation. And one of the takeaways I, I had from it was, um, I believe that there'll be some additional communication and education that we'll have to do with other cities based on some of the comments that I had heard in letting people know that mental health issues cross all sorts of, they don't respect city boundaries. And it doesn't matter if you're from a small city or a big city, we all, uh, each of us have a responsibility here and are facing a crisis and need to take action. Um, I also had the opportunity to talk with uh, our most fantastic executive director of the DRAA, the, the Diablo Regional Arts Association. I'm honored to be the council liaison to the DRAA and for people that don't know they are the uh, nonprofit partner of our fantastic Lesher Center for the Arts. I believe our city clerk is going to assist me with a PowerPoint presentation that they had provided and get that up on the screen. Um, but the, the, the key here, and, and I appreciate both uh, Executive Director White and Elizabeth Orcutt, the communications director for putting together this great presentation for us. Um, is the DRAA remains absolutely steadfast and committed to connecting the community with artists that they love in support of the regional center that they love. And especially, and Susie, if we could go to the next slide or, or Amy. And especially during these unprecedented times, uh, the DRAA and its sponsors understand and how important the arts are to our mental and physical well-being. And while the curtain has been down and the lights have been off at the center, the group has been just working tirelessly to ensure that the arts remain relevant in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and in this presentation, I'll touch on some of the real key, key things that they're working on and some cool programs that you have to look forward to. The next slide um, is, is the hallmark of what they've been working on, which is a series of virtual concerts. And uh, all of these will be done kind of over the course of the fall, starting with uh, country star Mark McKay will be giving a virtual concert on September 25th. All of these concerts, by the way, are available on DRA's Facebook or YouTube website. They're also, they'll also be broadcasted on uh, Walnut Creek TV and Walnut Creek TV's YouTube channel. 
And in the corner though, you're, you'll see the most important part is they're all free. And they're all free because the DRAA worked really hard with its corporate sponsors to ensure that each of these artists have a connection with the center. And it was vitally important to them, not only that they practice their craft during this time, but that they also share it with this community because they've all performed at the Lesher Center and it means a lot to them. Mark McKay is open for acts like Blake Shelton and Tim McGraw. And he was here last summer performing at the Lesher Center. He's performing with Mr. McKay will be uh, Greg Barnhill, Bobby Boyd, CJ Solar, and Chris Sly. And for those, for my fellow country music fans, uh, you'll know country music is three chords in the truth. And so I'm sure we'll get some of that on September 25th from Mr. McKay. Then on October 3rd, we, the DRA switched, switches things up a bit with Sarah McKenzie, who is a London-based, world-renowned uh, jazz musician. And we're really honored and privileged that she's taking part in this concert. She's collaborated with musicians around the world during COVID times and continued to perform. And she put together um, a full concert length virtual video experience that connects, and I'm using her words, different nationalities, different styles of music, and celebrates great composers. And I'm told that there's a sing-along to look forward to at the end. And she also was generous in her time in putting together a, a video for the DRA members, which I and Director Safine were able to view at our, our last uh, board meeting and she was talking about her experience in working around the world with different artists and how that's enriched her life. And this is a quote from her. It's so much more than the color of somebody's skin, your background, or where you're from. The common goal has always been playing together. You can only do that when everybody listens to each other and works together. That concert we have to look forward to on October 3rd. November 13th then, we have the High School Notes program, which is a takeoff of the very popular College Notes program. But this is going to feature acapella and choral groups of some of our local high schools, including Northgate and the Contra Costa School for the Performing Arts. It's hosted by Deke Sharon, who was the producer of the Pitch Perfect movies and sponsored by NBC Bay Area. So this is really going to be another thing where we're going to engage the youth and bring out some a lot of fun, active activity uh, online and available for everyone to watch. And then last but certainly not least is uh, geared toward the elementary school crowd, their parents and their caregivers and teachers. It's put on by Deluxe Puppets, who has done programs before at the Lesher to great acclaim, and they put together a program called Quarantine Time Machine, which is really focused on the, the mental health, the social and emotional well-being of our children during this pandemic time, and it, it's a series of four video lessons uh, with different titles, the first being School is Different, How to Manage Extreme Emotions. I think I need to tune in for that one. Practicing Empathy and How to Manage Uncertainty. These were put together by mental health experts and teachers, and the information is going to be available. These, these videos are available both in English and in Spanish. We're ready for our next slide, Amy. The goals of all these programs are community engagement, educational outreach, and boosting the local economy. So as part of these virtual concerts, which again, we all get to enjoy from the comfort of our own home, thanks to the generosity of the DRAA and its sponsors. So the, the minor ask for all of us is why not partner it with a takeout meal from one of your favorite local restaurants? The, you can, these, these concerts are tailor-made for pairing with your favorite barbecue restaurant in terms of Mr. McKay's concert, as to Sarah McKenzie, maybe pick something with a more international flair. 
and for our great high school kids, go all American. So that that is, I appreciate these efforts. I'm looking forward to tuning into all these concerts, as I know all of you are, and seeing if uh, and getting takeout from our favorite Walnut Creek restaurants while we watch these concerts from home. And the next slide, is Mark McKay also shared this quote that these performances will inspire artists and art lovers alike during this challenging time. And I think that's very true. One of the other items that the DRAA is very busy working on, and if you drive downtown, you'll see uh, the efforts being made. And on the next slide there, there's a, a, a Pave the Way fundraising campaign. That's an opportunity to strengthen the cornerstone of our community, as the mayor pointed out in a YouTube video. And this fundraising campaign will help the Lesher Center provide, continue to provide, I should say, high quality performances, exhibitions, and educational programs. There are a variety of different fundraising opportunities. Absolutely no donation is too small. The pavers themselves come at two different price levels. One is a, a, a thousand dollar level for an eight by eight paver. And the other is a $5,000 level for a 16 by 16 paver. Those sound like large numbers, but what I've heard of from Peggy White is there's some neighborhoods that are getting together and, and going in on a paver together. And uh, this neighborhood was from Pleasant Hill. So I'm challenging our Walnut Creek neighborhoods to think creatively this way and how great it would be to have a permanent reminder of your community togetherness in front of the Lesher Center and a testament to how great uh, this center is for all, and how much it enriches all of our lives. On the next slide, we'll see that, uh, well, let me give a quick update. So this was, <laughs> these. this is a very active group of very intelligent, smart, committed, engaged, energetic people. So during their quiet phase of their campaign, they've already raised nearly half a million dollars. They're about to start on the public phase of the campaign. And it would be great if we could show up for them as well and do as much for the DRA and the Lesher Center as they've done for all of us. Another very exciting update is the Plaza, which is the Redney Plaza, which is underway. And on the next slide, the projected uh, soft opening date, I should say, is, is October 4th, because uh, this will serve this outdoor plaza, which is a result of a public-private partnership between the city and the DRAA, will really serve as a fourth stage for our Lesher Center. And it'll open up a lot of new opportunities for outdoor performances, jazz concerts, gathering spaces, and it's right in the heart of downtown. We're all very excited to see this come to fruition and, and to see the Redney Plaza open uh, and then looking forward to the next year when we can actually start activating that plaza and having some great and exciting new uh, performances there. And then finally, uh, as most of all my council colleagues know, because we all attend and look forward to this event every year, which is the main gala that the DRA puts on in early October is called On Broadway. And normally Locust Street is closed off and we have a nice fun dinner and auction and are celebrating all the performances and the arts. This year they're going off Broadway because we can't gather in person. And so that what normally would be the weekend when we'd be going attending this gala, we'll instead be watching uh, Sarah McKenzie's concert from home and dining from one of our favorite local Walnut Creek restaurants. So I just want to say again, I thank my colleagues for um, appointing me to serve you as a liaison to the DRAA. I want to thank again, Peggy White, the executive director. She is a fantastic person. Every time I get off the phone with her, I feel better than when I was before. So I want to thank her for her tireless leadership and being a champion for our Lesher Center. I also want to thank Elizabeth Orcutt for putting together those slides for me, which helped to convey their message. And they wanted to make sure that I thanked our Walnut Creek communications team, Matt Bolander, Betsy Burkhart, and Liz Payne for the great, great collaboration 
and cooperation they receive. Wow, okay. Um, I, I, I don't know that you can top that, Cindy, but if there's any person who can, it would be you. So would you please share your work? Um, thank you very much. And Matt, thank you so much for the update on DRAA. I did check my um, charitable contribution list and I've, I have bought my paper like I promised to do when they first brought the project to us a few months back. So whew, thanks for the reminder and checking that. The, um, I am the liaison from the council to Walnut Creek downtown. Their September meeting was a week ago. And I guess the important thing um, to note about all of the discussions with um, Walnut Creek downtown is um, they truly appreciate everything that the city's been doing on the rebound program, but they are terribly concerned about how long this will last and, and the long-term impacts of this. We're already seeing numerous stores. We know some others that will be closing um, in the coming months and they are concerned. They're working hard, but they continue to be concerned. I will mention again from my colleagues, um, tonight we approved um, under the consent calendar that um, those who would be voting as delegates and alternate delegates at the annual conference of the League of Cities. The League of Cities this year is a virtual conference. It is only $100 per person. So my other colleagues, as, as well as staff members, it wouldn't take much for the $100 registration fee. And it's three days of virtual breakout sessions and other events. There is even going to be a trivia night and you can participate in the East Bay Division trivia team. The mayor and I um, regularly attend, the mayor does in particular, but I do as well, the meetings of the Community Homeless Task Force. And I wanted to pass on that I think one of the things that becomes apparent when you attend those monthly meetings is the partnership between community members, the Trinity Center, the county and the core teams from the county and um, our police department and their homeless outreach program. And just to clarify, the um, homeless outreach program came about with um, the police department because Trinity Center, knowing what its role needed to be, wanted the police to do a community policing approach on homelessness as well, to be a partner with them. And so I appreciate um, how much all those groups are working toward um, improving the homeless situation in Walnut Creek. And I will, um, I too was at the mayor's conference and appreciate what we heard about um, mental health response opportunities. I think there were a couple of lessons learned from the presentation by the county health officer, Anna Roth, and one of which was this is really a regional issue and needs to be that the model um, of the model programs that you see across the country, whether it's in Oregon or Olympia, Washington or Polesboro, Washington, et cetera, are all regional programs where there is a density of people that where you can share services. So I look forward to this progressing forward and thank you to the city manager for your work on this with the um, city managers across the county. And I would mention that we have a number of meetings with um, members of the business community related to the rebound program. I will let the mayor speak on that. And as my last item, I will end on something very, very happy. Although we were constrained by um, COVID in terms of community service day, we are having a community wide food drive on October 10th. People will be manning um, booths outside of grocery stores and we have eight grocers who are participating. It's not the, so you can go into the grocery store on that Saturday. And when you're shopping for yourself, you can also shop for other members of the community and then make your donation right there. People will be distributing bags in neighborhoods and collecting donations and different organizations from schools to the faith community to um, service groups are basically running food drives that day. So we are gonna keep our fingers crossed that we can raise more than, um, collect more than 10,000 pounds of food that day, which would feed a lot of people who are in need across not only our county, but across the state at this point in time. And thank you very much. And uh, next. Well, it would be Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, that's oh. me. Well, let, let, yeah. me quickly, let me quickly ask, Cindy, I'm not sure if it would be you or the mayor regarding the rebound program and the plan when it becomes 
colder and into fall and winter. So if, if, uh, if the mayor's gonna be talking about that, great, but if not, then I'd like to hear a little bit of an update. Do you want me to say, at least initially, we've had preliminary conversations with staff about winterizing and staff is having those conversations with the businesses because it's not only a challenge about cold, which means they need heaters, but it's also about wet and how you actually keep the water moving through the um, curbs and gutter system. So they right now they're pretty much blocked with the way the extensions into the street have been built. So there's a lot of issues. Um, in addition, the fire service does not allow you to enclose things with open heating systems. So, you know, you need to keep it open for COVID. You need to keep it closed to keep out the water. The water. You need to keep it open for heat. It's um, a balancing act. But did I summarize it? Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, and, work in progress. Okay. Yes. So, Walnut Creek downtown continues to keep all the businesses abreast of all of that, I take it? Oh, yes, and the businesses are working with city staff on this. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. All right. Um, the real goal is to get us down to, let's see, we, red. We're purple. We want to get to red because red actually opens some of the indoor um, facilities. And, and there is hope that we're getting really close and that our three weeks will um, happen just when we need them. Um, so yeah, let's let's keep up the testing. Let's let's do what we need to do. Um, we have to rely on the rest of the county, but let's just keep our fingers crossed that we can pull it off. Yep, yep. All right, great. Thank you. Well, I'll add in my my two cents on the mayor's conference as well, which obviously we were all at. And the only extra part that I would add on that is that when we heard from Supervisor Mitch, uh, Mitchoff, she talked about a couple of plans and I asked her specifically to find out, to pick a plan, to find out the cost and to let the cities know what that would be and what our share would be because we really don't have time to waste. We wanna be able to work on this immediately. But, and she did elucidate why this is needed for the county as uh, Council Member Silva had mentioned and not just for the city, because for example, in the unincorporated area of Walnut Creek, if there's a mental health crisis, are we just supposed to then let that go? If the city had some kind of its own solution, we're then not, not working with any other entities or agencies. So it really is important to be part of a larger picture in this, because as we know, mental health crisis uh, breakdowns and responses need to happen in a much broader area. So I did ask uh, Supervisor Mitchoff for that. We'll hopefully have an answer to that one very soon. Uh, I also had a meeting with uh, County Connection on, on the board, and during the operations committee meeting, we reviewed COVID-19 sanitation protocols. I've asked that since the public is mostly unaware of this, that we do outreach with other transit agencies, letting the public know of the sanitation procedures for transit so people will feel more comfortable in using public transit again. And coincidentally, or maybe not, AC Transit had an ad today that I saw about just this topic. So we are going to be working with the other transit agencies to let people know exactly what those procedures will be and why they should feel safe and secure in being able to take public transit. And my last point is something that I just added at the end. And uh, Dan, I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure who would answer this on the city staff, but a couple of people brought up the Shadelands Warriors G League. I know that when this came up a couple of months ago, uh, the council and city were unaware of it as well. It was a, a private enterprise. And I don't know if anybody has followed up on that. Perhaps uh, either Kevin Safine has or, or somebody else within staff. Yeah, I can speak to that one. Uh, Dan Buckshy, city manager. Uh, yes, it's understanding that the G League will practice at the Shadelands, but they will be playing elsewhere, uh, possibly at St. Mary's or some other larger type of uh, stadium. So it's our understanding they will be practicing. Do we know when that's supposed to start? I don't have the exact details with me at the moment, but um, they're working through the plan. They're excited to move forward here. It's really just, it, it's on them in order to work out the final details that have to do with the NBA, not anything specific to Walnut Creek, but uh, we have met with the, uh, the general manager of the team, um, Ethan Bendernagel from our uh, uh, community development department and toured the facility to see if there are any uh, challenges they might have, but given that it'll be a practice facility, it sounds like it's going to work uh, quite well for that. Great, that's the ultimate field house? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you, that's my report. 
Thank you. So we're up to me, and I guess I'm going to have to say something about the mayor's conference. And what it is, is we are not done with the work, not by a long shot. And uh, our city manager, Dan Buckshai, is continuing to lead the mayor's, excuse me, the city managers and other people um, trying to work out the solutions. Uh, they are expected to return and give a more detailed report to the mayor so that there is, and recommendations, I believe, um, in January or February um, of this year. And uh, we're looking forward to that. You, you don't just plant a seed and have it pop up in a full blown program. There are lots and lots of steps and lots of lots of things to invent. No community is exactly the same and we've got to deal with what we have here. I am proud to, um, I, I hope I'm not um, beating somebody's thunder, but I've gotten some information that I think will make us all proud. Um, Trinity Center has been selected by Senator Glazer as his nonprofit of the year, and there will be some kind of celebration um, for it. And um, I think there is also going to be sometime pretty soon um, virtual opening open house so that people can see um, what is available to the people who most need it. Um, I went to the CCTA planning committee meeting and um, they, they are incredible at finding ways to get alternative funding. And uh, they found some grant money to help them do the community calculation of vehicles mile vehicle miles traveled, which is the new standard for CEQA. And so that's it. Um, there's um, a little community called, um, it's, I don't even know the official, um, Waldock Creek Downtown Arts Alliance or whatever. Um, it has a different name every time I hear it. Um, but I want to emphasize to people that the very minute you feel like you can go outside, you need to drop by downtown. There's a new mural that's really exquisite. Um, they're in the process of building, I won't say what, but it'll entertain your family um, and, and help you pass the time. Uh, there are trees with decorations and uh, we're still working on, oh, and the arts um, scavenger hunt, um, which you can do with your um, smartphone. So uh, please come down to downtown. Our businesses need you and you need our businesses because they got darn good food and good things happening. So please come down and join us. I believe that's the end of mine. And so we're hey, on. Peter, can I ask you a question? I'm glad you brought up all of those arts things that are happening. Perhaps Walnut Creek downtown and that group could come and just give us a little um, public before at the start of one of our meetings, like maybe next meeting, just give us a few slides. Sounds, They've been sounds like, yes. The pictures tell a lot about what's happening. They do, they do, they the really store, do. The first storefront gallery is being installed on Friday. Oh, see, I even forgot about that. There's lots happening downtown um, and we are the center of the arts in our region and we want everyone to enjoy and, and, and learn um, because of that. So congratulations for everybody who's participated in that. And actually um, Mayor Pro Tem um, at, at Wilk has helped uh, as, as a, as a, a, a subject matter expert in the in the art for the rebound committee too so thank you um all who are trying to get feet and butts in seats well not the feet in the seats but the butts okay back to serious stuff uh, next on the agenda is a consideration item for the letters of support for state assembly bills 1506 1196 1775 2617, 434, and 1286. Uh, at this time, I would like the staff to make a presentation. Yeah, good evening, Dan Buckshy, City Manager. I'm going to introduce this item. 
Uh, as your council likely knows, the legislative session in Sacramento, Sacramento ended at the end of August, which means that the bills that made it through uh, the legislature are now before the governor. The governor has until the end of this month, uh, rough, well, two more weeks in order to decide whether to sign or veto these bills. As you'll hear in a few moments, uh, due to COVID, this was quite an unconventional legislative session. Uh, the legislature was asked by the governor to narrow the focus of bills. As such, there was not nearly the volume as there was in prior years or as typically in prior years. And in addition, there were some high priority bills that simply did not make it through because they ran out of time. So what's occurred since then are obviously bills that we have been tracking closely and before you this evening are six bills for your council's consideration. Our legislative committee here, which is comprised of our mayor and mayor pro tem, reviewed these matters and others about two weeks ago and are recommending that your council authorize sending letters of support to the governor that he signed these bills into law. And with that, I am going to introduce Casey Elliott, who is who works with Townsend Public Affairs and helps represent our interests in Sacramento. Welcome, Casey. Uh, good evening. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, if it's all right, I just want a brief update to give you a little bit more uh, context as to what happened at the end of the session. It was a um, as was mentioned, it was a very interesting, uh, unique end of section for this year to, to cap off what was uh, obviously a very, very different year. Um, just to back up a little bit, to provide a little bit of context, uh, as, as the legislature moved into the final week of session, um, as uh, was mentioned, they were already focused, had narrowed down their number of bills that they were considering due to impacts on the legislative calendar from the recesses due to COVID earlier in the, in the session. Um, so there were really full of top areas going into the, the final week of session, um, public safety related measures, uh, housing, housing production related measures, um, COVID response bills, and, and then a few bills dealing with wildfires. Um, as we moved into the last week of session, um, Senator Jones, a uh, Republican in, from Southern California, um, about four days prior to the end of session, it was um, uh, announced that he had tested positive for, for COVID-19. Um, the senator is okay. He, he is fine. Um, unfortunately, that had a, a ripple effect on the on the end of session. Um, prior to the his his uh, his test, uh, the senator had participated in a Republican caucus meeting uh, with his colleagues, as well as a farewell dinner to some of the retiring senators. As a result all but one of the Republican Senate Republican caucus members had to quarantine during the final four days of, of um, the legislative set. They were allowed to participate via Zoom um, in, in the final four sessions. However, uh, this setup really created a lot of friction, a lot of animosity, um, not only between Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, uh, but also between the Senate and the Assembly. Um, obviously, the, the Republicans felt that they were being um, unfairly kind of pushed out of Capitol. Earlier in the year, we had had a couple of Democratic Assembly members test positive for COVID and, and, and session was paused. The summer recess was extended um, to make sure that, that public health measures were, were taken. Unfortunately, given the end of session, which was constitutionally driven, there, there wasn't that opportunity. So that created some friction. Additionally, um, the bulk of the bills that were remaining were Assembly bills that were in the Senate. Um, so the Assembly, due to the pace of taking up bills in the Senate, felt that the Senate wasn't moving quick enough, so they decided to kind of drag their heels. So really, it just created a lot of friction going into the last couple of days. Uh, all of this kind of rolled over on the last night of session, where the Senate Democrats tried to limit debate on, on measures so they could move th more through. Um, it, it, was, it got pretty ugly on, on the last night of session. All of this context is to say that there were a lot of bills this year, more so than any year that I call, that didn't get, that didn't pass the legislature, not because there weren't necessarily the, the, the votes for them, but just because the measures weren't able to be considered on the floor at all, just time, time ran. So as, as I'm going to provide just kind of a brief highlight on, on some of the major areas, um, a lot of the measures that did not move forward here, I would anticipate are going to get reintroduced next year. Um, where you don't, presumably you don't have the constraints that, that this year's legislative saw. 
So just briefly, as, as we talk about public safety bills, there were a, a couple of major bills that did not move through. Um, 8066, which would have limited um, the use of, of rubber bullets and tear gas um, for lawfully assembled crowds. Uh, that measure did not receive a vote on, on, um, on the floor, so that bill did not ask. Senate Bill 731 by Senator Bradford, which would have created a process um, for for law enforcement officers that are uh, guilty of misconduct um, to have some due certification process go on at the state level. Um, that measure was controversial, unclear if it would have had the votes to move out of legislature. That bill did not get considered at all. Um, and SB 766 by Senator Skinner, which would have expanded on her legislation regarding um, transparency of um, personnel records and other files uh, for law enforcement, another measure that did not get considered um, because it, it ran out of time. Um, then when we move over to the areas of housing, housing production, as you'll recall, in the aftermath of the defeat the earlier this year, the Senate program made a focus on, on per, pursuing a package of housing-related bills. There were about bills um, at the beginning of the year um, on the Senate side, or about, about the same number of assembly bills, mainly by tying it through a um, appropriation suspense file, and then um, the issues that occurred on the floor at the, at the end of session, only two bills, AB 725 uh, and AB 2345 made it through. Pretty much all of the other major housing legislation uh, failed, either was held in committee or, or failed to get out, um, be considered on the floor. Most notably uh, were the pro tems two measures that uh, SB 95, which would have created some sequel streamlining provisions for smaller affordable housing projects, and SB 1120, which would have created a ministerial process for uh, duplexes and lot splits. Both of those bills were not considered on the assembly floor uh, until after 11 p.m. on last night by the session. So while both of those measures didn't pass in the assembly, it, it was not enough time for those measures to get back to the Senate for their final vote. So uh, consequently, those, those measures failed as well. So really, there was just a lot, uh, a, a lot of inaction, uh, a lot of um, to use the sports analogy, just kind of bad, bad clock management um, really is, is what it boiled down to. So I think we'll see a lot of the bills um, that didn't get done this year will be reintroduced next year. Um, that said, before this evening uh, for consideration are um, several bills that did make it through. Um, as the city manager noted, the measures that did pass are now with the governor for his iteration. He has until the end of September, September 30th, um, to consider these measures. Um, either sign them, veto them, uh, in the rare and he, he can send a, a bill back without his signature, which would then become law. Um, I don't know that any of these bills would be subject to an option that the governor has. Um, from, a, from a big picture, I think the governor has about 350 bills or so um, that are before, which is by far the lowest number um, in, in recent memory. Um, so he should have no problem moving through all of the bills that are before him. Um, just really quickly, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just provide maybe a brief summary of each of the letters that are um, before you for consideration. Um, the first measure is Mayor, um, now, I, I understand you, Casey. Yeah, I think we're, Casey, um, before we start, before we start this section, um, it looks like we've also frozen a council member. So uh, can we have a break and come back and we'll fix your sound problem and we'll and we'll retrieve our frozen mayor, uh, council member. So let's take a 10 minute break. Thank you. Casey, if you can stay on and we will troubleshoot with you.
welcoming back uh, Casey Elliott, who will now take us through the um, approval letters. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, just the, the first letter that we have before you uh, is AB 1506 by Assembly Member McCarty. Um, this bill um, would establish a process by which um, a, a state prosecutor shall conduct an investigation of any officer involved in um, that, re excuse me, that results in the death of an unarmed civilian uh, in, in California. Additionally, the bill would um, direct the attorney general who should who will serve as the state prosecutor unless someone else is named. Uh, beginning in July of 2023, they will operate a police practices division um, that can also, upon request of local law enforcement review, um, use of de deadly force policies uh, of local government agencies. Um, this measure was amended quite a bit towards the end of the session. Uh, it's something that Assemblymember McCarty has been working on for, for quite a while, um, for, for several years, given the incidents that have occurred in, in his district in Sacramento. Um, the league was, uh, had a watch position on, on this measure, um, and, and it's before you for consideration of a support, excuse me, a request for signature position from the governor. Um, the next measure before is AB 1196. Um, this measure would create a, a statewide um, law that would prohibit law enforcement agencies from authorizing carotid restraint holds and choke holds. Um, that you know, the cities had a, a watch position on this measure as well. Um, the next measure before you, excuse me, is AB 1775 by Mr. Jones Sawyer. Uh, this measure would make a misdemeanor to, to knowingly use the 911 system to harass uh, another person based on a uh, on a perceived or actual class of individual, including race, religion, gender, sexual orientation. Uh, it does create civil penalties um, uh, that can be applied against people who make um, those claims. Um, this measure was supported by the League of Cities as well. Um, the next measure, AB 2617 by Assembly Member Gabriel. Um, this would, uh, relates to um, uh, gun violence restraining orders would make it, um, would essentially apply uh, gun, gun restraining orders that are for issued out of state apply them within California as though they were state um, issued. Um, we also contain some provisions re <clears throat> regarding um, notification of the courts of new state level um, restraining orders that are issued as the, uh, the League of Cities has a support position on, on this. And then the last two, um, AB 434 by Assembly Member Daly. Um, this measure is, is attended to streamline um, several of the housing programs that are run within uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development to make them align um, from, from a processing and application standpoint with the uh, My Family Housing Program. Um, I believe it applies to seven programs in total, which currently have uh, different applications and different, um, different procedures to so align them all. Uh, the League of Cities was in support of this measure. And then the last bill in front of you is um, Assembly Bill 1286 by Assembly Member Merit Suchi, um, which would require uh, shared mobility device providers, um, Lime, jump bikes, things along those lines, to obtain a permit or agreement with a city or county seeks to operate in uh, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, comply with local rules. Uh, additionally, it would require those mobility device providers to maintain uh, minimum levels of um, liability insurance. This measure is something that uh, the league has worked on for the last couple of years and, and are supportive of this bill. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about um, any of these any of these bills. Thank you. Council members, are there anybody who would like to, to uh, have questions? And would you please use your blue hand because I can't see you all, so. Oh, now I can. Thank you. Um, Council Member Silva. Um, thank you very much. And this is about AB 1506. I had a couple of questions, if you don't mind. I know this bill changed quite a bit, particularly I think in the last month in the legislature. It had originally been on request and now it says shell, but it was constrained to only unarmed. Um, 
civilians that who are killed. Um, can you, can someone explain, would we be able to make a request and would the DOJ be required to take up a case on the request of local law, law enforcement, whether it be a police department, a sheriff's department, or a district attorney's office? Yeah, you're, you're correct. This bill ended several times in the last uh, weeks of, of session uh, to go from exactly what you mentioned. But the previous provisions were upon request of local law enforcement, city council. Uh, I think there might have been another one in there um, to a, a shall, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, investigate, but then limited to the instances. Along with that, there was some pre related provisions um, under the previous ones. If a local agency had requested an investigation, they also had to reimburse the attorney general's office. So those provisions were removed. Um, I know that some of the proponents that were, were in favor of these amendments refer to the current process that the attorney general's office has where um, investigations can be requested. Obviously, um, I, I, you guys are aware that the attorney general obviously has discretion as to undertake those investigations or not. Um, so there, this bill doesn't do anything to the existing process. Um, I know that from interactions with the assembly member's office, the author's office, um, I think these were the provisions ultimately he could get to get the bill out of um, the legislature, not necessarily the, the full strength of what he wanted. So it would not surprise we see fall legislation introduced next year, um, perhaps around the 2023 trigger um, that, that he's using for the new unit that'll be created in the attorney general office. So, so to answer your question right now, no, there isn't a, a new request process done through this bill, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Ms. Party uh, pursue something like that next year. I have two more questions related to this. Is this a retroactive or would it be going forward as a for officer involved shootings that occur after the um, law would take effect, which I think is January 2021. Oh my gosh, would 2020 ever end? <laughs> um, yeah, the, the bill is silent on retroactivity. So um, you're correct, the bill would take effect, um, the investigation, uh, the mandatory investigation provisions would take effect on January 2021. Um, the bill is silent about retroactivity. Um, generally, if, if uh, uh, and I should pre preface, I am not a lawyer, so I do not, uh, <laughs> I'm not providing legal uh, information here, but um, generally, uh, if a bill you know, does not have the retroactivity, then we would look at forward as a going forward basis. Um, but again, I went on the ability to for the attorney general to retroactively look at cases that would have met this threshold um, prior to January 21. My last question, and maybe a lawyer would have to answer this question. Who determines if someone was unarmed? Because sometimes in many cases you see around the country, that is that is the crux of the debate. And it would seem that somebody has to determine that. There's probably a legal definition of it, but who is going to determine that before it gets automatically sent to Sacramento? And that's not necessarily a reason to not do this, but that would set re then require enabling legislation, wouldn't it, to actually make this really work? Our city attorney has oh, indicated... <laughs> So the, the bill defines both a deadly weapon and an unarmed civilian. And so it, it specifies the type of weapon that the individual uh, would have to have for the person to be considered armed, if you will. And so that's, that is how the, the circumstances would dictate it. So if a person had a handgun in their hand, that's clearly going to be someone who is not an unarmed civilian. And it, it's a relatively, uh, well, the definition of, of a deadly weapon is, it, it includes um, guns, it includes, let's see, what else does it have here? Switchblade knives, uh, certain types of ballistic knives, daggers, billies, uh, blackjack plastic knuckles, or metal knuckles. So it, it defines specifically what deadly weapons are. And then it says that the investigations must occur if the person 
uh, was an unarmed civilian. So if, it, if the person does not have one of those items, then that person is by definition an unarmed civilian. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Matt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Casey, thanks for the update. In terms of the, what does a watch position mean? The league was a watch, had a watch position on UB 1506. Yeah, the, the league, um, they had at one point a support position um, and then they didn't. So we kind of default to a, a, a watch position is, is kind of a kinder way of saying no position or, or they didn't have to, they don't have uh, an official neutral position or a support position or an opposed position um, on their materials um, that they've made available. So watch is just kind of another way of saying they, they didn't have a, a official position on record. Can I, can I augment, on that? Yeah, I augment on that being on the board of the league and sitting in these, oftentimes we will be taking a position in June and then the bill shifts. And so without the board convening to rediscuss the bill, we that position, the support or opposed position has to shift to a watch because it's moving. And the same thing happened. Actually, we have to do this at the board meeting we have in two weeks for the league because of a proposition and language change between the legislature and the initiators of the proposition. So we have to reconsider our position. Thank you. That, that's helpful. And then the other um, question was more just broad uh, policy based. And I know that the fires obviously had a devastating impact late in the legislative session, but were there just from a broad strokes kind of policy standpoint, what do you see happening at the state level in terms of trying to get a handle on these devastating wildfires? Yeah, yeah. as you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, the wildfires, um, you know, came started kind of coming in right at the end of the legislative session. So the legislature didn't have out of time to, to enact policy related. There was one measure passed, um, Senate Bill 182 by Senator Jackson. It was actually introduced tonight in, in most of the way through the process last year. It was kind of rekindled in the last two weeks of session. Uh, it, it requires some additional planning uh, in, in uh, consideration of high, <clears throat> excuse me, high, high fire severity zones uh, in local planning uh, and development and land use it creates a plan, uh, programs for small jurisdictions to adequately plan for those types of things. Um, that said, I mean, it was, that was the only bill that kind of directly got into the planning issues related to wildfires. Um, as part of the budget, the governor uh, had been provided a funding Cal Fire for additional resources. So at least from a financial standpoint, there was some some forethought that this was going to be a uh, an act of fire season um, between the general fund dollars that were set aside for that, and then the state's been able to leverage some of the federal COVID dollars um, for things along uh, evacuation centers, PPE. So those dollars, um, at least the state has had tried to do some floor planning. I think that we will see again in January probably more of a of a response. Um, you know, after paradise, like I said, we saw legislation that was related a lot to uh, evacuation planning and those types of things. I think we'll probably see additional funding for, uh, for some vegetation management and, and, and those type of activities. But really, I think that we're looking probably towards January, February, before we see probably more meaningful wildfire related legislation come through. The benefit to that is at least the legislature will have kind of had the entirety of the fires and um, to, to see what some of the issues are and maybe what can be addressed through policy uh, versus what probably just needs additional resources in response to that through the budget. Thank you. Okay, am I seeing any more? I am not. Um, City Clerk, would you please see if there is any public comment related to this item? Yes, we do have a few speakers. We'll bring okay. in Adam Neiman. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. 
Um, again, I'm Adam Neiman, pronouns he, him, his, resident of Walnut Creek. And I am, uh, I I'm just want to say that I'm in support of the, uh, the bills that are, that are proposed here and in support of supporting them as a city of Walnut Creek. I would also like to um, urge the support of AB 2542 and AB 3234. Um, AB 2542 is the Racial Justice Act, which uh, asserts that civil rights in the courtroom and uh, asserts civil rights in the courtroom and prohibits the state from using discrimination uh, by means of uh, basically in the courts, um, those meaning to seek or obtain conviction or sentence. Um, there's a lot of information that I could go into, but I don't have that much time. So I'm also, I'm just going to skip forward. AB 3234 then also uh, is related to um, justice and particularly within the prison system in California. And it expands eligibility for elder parole program. Um, so right now, if you're 60 years of age or older, you have, and you've served 25 years of your sentence, then you're eligible for elderly parole. Uh, and this would just basically take that exact same thing, but just cut it down a little bit so that it would be 20 years of your sentence. And if you're over 50 years of age uh, and the rate of recidivism is much lower at that point in, uh, anyway. So uh, I just wanted to urge the support of AB 32, 34 and AB 2542 in addition to the ones that you've discussed tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Joshua Ferrer. Hello, and apologies for the sweat, multitasking in the long meetings. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to briefly say, uh, make sure you all can hear me, yeah. I just wanted to briefly say um, that I urge you to support AB 1196 uh, and AD 1775, uh, which looks like you will, which is great. Um, AD 1506, more conflictual. It was quite watered down. It's like, <laughs> this is really basic now. It's just requiring state prosecutors to investigate officer involved sh fatal shootings of unarmed civilians. Like, this sh it should be, there should be a requirement to. Uh, a state prosecutor to investigate any officer involved in shooting period. Um, and then I also just wanted to say, I guess in my position of, uh, as part of FOSAF, that um, we are um, urging support of um, Senate Bill 1185, which is County Board of Supervisors Sheriff Oversight, which authorizes the county to establish a Sheriff Oversight Board of Subpoena Power, AB 2054, which is Emergency Services Community Response Grant Program, which creates the Crisis um, Act, uh, this is basically non-police response to um, social services. Um, it's small seed funding, but it's a start. Um, and then SB 803, which is mental health services, peer support specialist certification, which establishes peer support specialist certification program, a standard of care uh, and education training for peer and family member mental health workers. So I urge the city council to consider the additional support of those bills. Thank you. Thank you. Dan H. So it sounds like that bill um, will not qualify a garden tool as a deadly weapon, only like a knife or a, or a gun. So if that bill was um, available a year, 60, what, seven weeks ago, it would have said, hey, the, the Miles was not carrying a deadly weapon. He was carrying a garden tool. So I really wish we could have had, we could have go back in time in our little time spaceship and have that bill. But I, and, and so Miles would have, you know, been exonerated instead of his name being drugged through the mud saying he had a, uh, you know, a, a weapon on him when he had a garden tool and he was running home. So that's a, that's a shame, but we're still, we're finally waking up as a community, as a nation, and we're proposing these same logical bills to avoid the next murder. So I'm really happy with that. Let's think about that. Miles was, did not have a deadly weapon in his hand. We, we, we should support these bills and be, outspoken about it. 
for the health and safety of our community and all this, all the young people with mental health illness or even the old people or even the middle-aged people. So when they are in the middle of a mental health crisis and they have something in their hand, the police won't, won't distinguish it as a deadly weapon and kill them in broad daylight on videotape. I wish we could go back and have these same logical bills in the past, but we can't. We have to move forward as a nation and, and, and pass these bills. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any more? I don't see any additional speakers. Thank you. I'm bringing it back to council. Are there any questions or comment, additional questions or comments? Um, council member Silva. Um, clarification from the city attorney. Um, I appreciate the additional legislation that was suggested to us tonight. Are we in a position to be able to discuss any additional legislation? Um, I would recommend that if the council wanted to take a position on the additional legislation that you refer back to the legislative committee first and then have it come back to the council. Um, because if point, those so, items were not on the agenda tonight. But if those bills are on the governor's desk, they either are signed or or they're not signed before the end of the Correct. The, the, the council could either delegate authority to the ledge committee to express a position. The council could um, consider it at your next meeting, but that may be too late, or you could call a special meeting. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a follow-up question on that? I think it's for the city attorney as well. Is it, what parameters do we put on the bills that go before the legislation committee? Because I, the ones that I heard dealt with the courts and prisons, so it didn't seem like they directly affected local government. Is there a, there's kind of a weeding out process that happens at the beginning of the session where the legislative committee focuses on items that are local government related, I assume? Well, the council adopts a legislative platform every year that does focus on bills that are geared towards uh, issues that are relevant to the city specifically. And so that does limit it. I might defer to Carla or someone else to speak to that issue as well as to the scope. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, Steve, uh, you're correct. Um, the city adopts a legislative platform every year um, with general uh, legislative principles and policy positions. Um, and so what the legislative committee does is really consider bills um, that are fall within that legislative platform. And if they do not fall within the legislative platform, that's when those bills come to the council for consideration. Um, these two particular bills, um, Council Member Francois was correct, do not necessarily fall within the city's legislative platform. Um, so those would need to be brought back to council. Thank you. I'm sorry, Carla, I thought you were just gonna start because you unmuted yourself. It's, it's another new learning experience with Zoom. Um, does anybody have any additional questions or comments? I don't. I'll, just, I'll make a motion to approve the support for the bills AB 1506, AB 1196, 1775, 2617, 434, and 1286. Second. I have a motion and a second, and I need a roll call vote, please. Mayor Pro Tem Welk? Aye. Councilmember Silva? Aye. Councilmember Francois? Aye. Councilmember Aye. Waddell? Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Alrighty. All right, we're moving on to item 5B. I think we're ready for the staff report. May we please have it? Yeah, good evening. I'm gonna kick this one off, Dan Buckshy, city manager. Uh, tonight we're here to provide a comprehensive update of what has occurred since June 2nd, 2019, in which there was an officer involved shooting that resulted in the death of Miles Hall. Your council has received numerous updates on various issues that the city has been responding to. 
as your council and many members of the public are aware, we have been working with representatives of the Hall family and of the community for the past year. We have met uh, well over 20 times uh, with members of the BOSAF group over this past year in order to understand their perspective and concerns and to come to an agreement where we can on what to move forward. And as you'll hear, there are a few areas in which we are still not aligned, but uh, as you'll hear here in a few moments, there are nine different subject areas in which we've been addressing over the past year. And we are going to provide an update on each and every one of those. You know, I want to emphasize, uh, your council knows this, and I think some, some folks do as well, but this has been one of the top two priorities for the city this past year. This and COVID-19 have uh, emerged as uh, very key issues. Obviously, we have the four council priorities that you adopted in February or early March of 2019, but as we know, um, plans are adjusted over time depending upon what happens in our world and we have adapted accordingly. So there has been a team of several of our executive team members and our senior management that have been allocated this activity and um, we are moving full speed ahead to continue with the efforts that are underway. So with that, if we could pull up the PowerPoint and I'm going to kick things off. And while that's coming up, we are also going to hear tonight from Captain Jay Hill, who will be our interim police chief when, um, when Chief Chaplin retires in a few weeks. Also going to hear from Lieutenant Tracy Reese, as well as Assistant City Manager Terry Kilgore. So if we could go to the next slide. I am going to speak to the first item, which has really been the highest priority for uh, at least the members of the community that we've been hearing from on a regular basis. And this is for expanding non-law enforcement response for mental health emergencies. And I really think the scope is broader than that. It's for uh, non-violent emergencies in which there's a crisis of some sort. I don't know if it's just mental health related, could be alcohol related. We do something similar already for um, homeless in which we have a core team that we partner with the county for social workers that help serve our homeless. We also do the same already for some mental health issues in which we pair up a police officer with a social worker, again, from the county for what's called our, meta, our MET team, our mental health evaluation team. That latter team, however, is an after the fact program in which uh, folks who have had mental health crises who may have been uh, placed into a psychiatric hospital or some other type of facility who require follow-up, uh, that team checks on them uh, to help them stay uh, on track, if you will, on the balance beam moving forward. So what's occurred is um, we began really at the end of 2019 to engage with the county and in, in full speed, if you will, in early 2020 in January. Once we began diving into this, it was very apparent that this is not something Walnut Creek can do alone. One, there's just not the economies of scale, if you will. There's not enough demand to have a full 24 seven hour team in Walnut Creek. And secondly, the way California is structured, which is certainly different than some other states, is that counties are mandated by the state constitution per the Welfare and Institutions Code to provide these services and they receive funding. Counties on average receive about 40% of their overall budget from the state for health and human services programs of which mental health response is one of those. So we began at a staff level um, meeting with the county behavioral health team with Dr. Anna Ross, with uh, Roth rather, with Dr. Suzanne Tavano to talk about how we could expand some existing programs, modify programs, better integrate with not only Walnut Creek, but with other cities, because as you can imagine, a lot of other cities and a lot of community members throughout Contra Costa and out throughout the state, frankly, if not the country, are interested in these types of programs. And so it's best if we can partner. We began those efforts. And in fact, um, the county health team was slated to come speak to all 19 city managers on March 12th. 
And unfortunately, we ended up talking about COVID-19 and the coming restrictions and that was tabled. So candidly, we lost a few months on this. We regrouped and uh, Mayor Haskew sent a letter in July to the County Board of Supervisors formally requesting their active participation and support to help move forward a regional model. Uh, we then present, uh, that occurred in July at what is called the Mayor's Conference in which each of the 19 cities, the mayor is a part of a regional conference or meeting, if you will, most city council members attend also, and obviously it's to discuss matters of regional interest. This was the primary topic during that July meeting. The um, mayors of the, all 19 cities embraced the concept that was requested by Mayor Haskew on behalf of Walnut Creek and supervisors Karen Mitchoff and Candace Anderson, who represent Walnut Creek, were there and committed to having the county come back and give a presentation. In addition, at that July mayor's conference meeting, the, um, the mayors directed that a subcommittee of the city managers of the 19 cities work through the details and work through different options, work with the county, benchmark other programs throughout the country, and report back on a periodic basis about options for programs. Obviously, costs will come into play at some point and to come up with a model or models for the mayor's consideration, and then ultimately for each city's individual consideration. The September mayor's conference, which uh, was uh, about a week and a half ago, was that next update. Anna Roth, Dr. Anna Roth from, actually not doctor, I take that back, Anna Roth, from the uh, behavior county health director, gave the primary presentation in terms of what the county offers now. And one of the important points is that the, the initial response to a call for a, a crisis is one piece of the overall system of care. Obviously there are many factors what occurs afterward. How are folks transported? Where do they go? How are they evaluated? Where are they kept? What type of follow-up occurs? And she spoke to that a bit. And, but uh, what really is the focus for this particular effort is that initial call for crisis and what happens. And as was discussed, there are a lot of factors that come into play is one, what is the nature of the call? Is it violent or nonviolent? Is it a mental health crisis? Is it some other type of mental health crisis? And how is one to make that determination? And whether that's coming into the 911 system to the 211 system, or whether it's going to the county's mobile crisis response team directly, somebody has to triage that call and send an associate uh, the appropriate response. And obviously, there are risks both ways. You don't want to over respond unnecessarily with the uh, police to something that's not particularly dangerous. But on the flip side, you don't want to send social workers and clinicians into a very dangerous situation and have their lives put at risk. And there are instances actually uh, not too long ago, one here in Contra Costa, Contra Costa in which a mental health clinician uh, was murdered uh, by somebody who they had responded to uh, a mental health crisis. And so those are the types of things that are that many of the questions that came up that we were working to address. The city managers identified six different programs throughout the country, shared those with the county. Not surprisingly, the county is very familiar with these types of programs and the pros and cons and different considerations for each. And ultimately what this will boil down to is there are really a couple of different options. So the county has two programs in place that are very similar to the CAHOOTS model or to the San Antonio model, or the model that's in Olympia, Washington, and that there's what's called the MRT, or the mobile response team, that they have clinicians respond to youth-related mental health crises. And if I recall the statistics correctly, about 70% of those do not require law enforcement, uh, but about 20 or 30% do. There's also what's called the MCRT. Now, they're not particularly creative in their acronyms, saying so that, that C is very important. So this is the mobile crisis response team, which is for adults. And same thing, it's a, it's a, a non-PD response for mental health crises. I believe they have one team for the entire county. They've had it in place for about two years, so it's newer, whereas the youth focus program has been around for many years and is much more established. But going back to the adult program, they have one program for the entire county. It is not 24 seven. 
and it is also not instantaneous like a 911 call. Uh, certainly in Walnut Creek and in many other cities around the county, if a 911 call is made, our response time is usually five minutes or less, and sometimes considerably less, obviously, depending upon the location and the situation. All of these programs, including all of the ones that have benchmarked and all of the ones that we've been hearing about and reading about in the news and hearing about in public comment, none of those are an instantaneous 911 type of response. They are a much more delayed type of response because it is a nonviolent mental health crisis to which they are responding. And so those are the dynamics that uh, we are considering and working through. And what it boils down to, I think there are really three different options and I'm simplifying a bit. One is obviously to continue with the mobile crisis response team and the mobile response team at the county as is and expand it. The other is to expand it and modify and improve it. And the third is to introduce an entirely new model. Um, in talking with the cities, obviously, we don't absolutely have to partner uh, with the county. We could try to partner with one another and with not-for-profits, but the county has the expertise, has the funding, has the resources, and is obviously the regional entity that is mandated by the state in order to provide these types of services. So we do believe it is best to partner with the county and the other cities to identify these various issues challenges, and obviously solutions in order to implement a program. What I will say is the county has been very receptive, very interested in expanding this type of program. They've been a fantastic partner to work with so far. And I will wrap up my portion here by running through the few items that are on the slide here. I do want to um, highlight that your city council did allocate $100,000 of seed money to help get a program like this off the ground. There's no doubt that uh, the county will not have the funds to expand a program beyond where it is currently for all 19 cities in the entire county. And so likely there will be some type of uh, cost to cities. Now, obviously we would want to pursue grants and something that we've spoken with uh, Casey Elliott, who spoke on our last item is about identifying potential grant or other funding sources from the state to help kickstart this program, at least pilot money for a year or two as this gets off the ground. Well, you've heard loud and clear, and we obviously understand this as, as city managers and as mayors and council members, is stakeholder input will be important. And we are working with the county to identify key stakeholders. And there's really a few different types of stakeholders. There are those who are experts, who work at not-for-profits, are in the medical field, are in the mental health field that we want to consult with. There are what I would call mental health advocates, who have been very involved in the mental health system and the county has a long list of individuals and organizations with whom they work. And then the third category of state are more general advocates who are interested in reform but may not have the expertise of the former two groups that I just mentioned. So we intend, again, this is countywide, this is not just Walnut Creek, to identify key stakeholders throughout the region and meet with them to solicit input around current programs and around potential program design. We would then work on program design and options. And uh, as you can see there, we would do that the first quarter, calendar year quarter of 21. This also includes another update to the mayors at the February mayors conference. And then the idea would be, part of the reason you see the March timeframe is at that point we would identify costs and identify identify potential allocations to various cities in the county for how to pay for this program, at which point that would align quite well with the budget processes for all the municipalities to consider this. I think to be candid, while Walnut Creek has set aside money, given that most organizations have had to cut their budget anywhere from 10 to 20%, I think a mid-year allocation at most cities in order to fund an additional program is unlikely. And as we all know, COVID is lasting longer than we anticipated, not less. So many cities are anticipating having to make additional budget cuts this year. So while we would all like this to move more quickly, myself included, um, I think this is the time frame realistically we're looking at if we want a county lot, countywide solution. So with that, I am um, going to stop on this item and I'm going to introduce Captain Jay Hill who is going to talk through the next few items. Thank you, Dan. 
Good evening, Madam Mayor and fellow city council members. As uh, city manager just mentioned, I'm Captain Jay Hill from your Walnut Creek Police Department. I'm gonna to talk to you about a few other items uh, of interest on this agenda report. And Susie, can you go to the first slide, please? Okay. So the first one I wanna talk about is expanding the Central County Police Crisis Intervention Team. This is a little bit different than what the city manager just talked about in, in that what he was referring to was a non-law enforcement response to non-violent, non-volatile uh, crisis interventions. Uh, what I wanna talk about briefly is a concept that we're working towards that does involve law enforcement. So while we work toward a non-law enforcement response to these non-violent, non-volatile mental health calls, we believe there is still a need for a law enforcement response to violent or volatile calls for service. And to address this, Chief Chaplin met earlier this year with the police chiefs of our neighboring cities of Concord, Martinez, and Pleasant Hill, and initiated discussion to gauge the interest in participating in a shared response to mental health crises. The concept is to provide specialized crisis intervention training to a handful of officers from each department above and beyond uh, what is officers already received. The idea is to increase the availability and likelihood of at least one specially trained officer being available at any given time as a shared resource between jurisdictions and respond to mental health crises. Uh, this is seen as a supplement to the mobile crisis response team that the city manager was just talking about. And again, if we had, let's say four or five officers from Walnut Creek, maybe a few more from Concord since they are bigger, and we identified 18 officers or so that were given specialized training to deal with those in mental health crises, the idea is that we would have somebody on in all likelihood 24 seven. And if a call came out in Martinez and we had somebody available in Walnut Creek, we can send our officer to Martinez to help them out. So that's the idea behind these conversations that are taking place uh, between the police chiefs. Uh, Chief Chaplin already brought me into these conversations and I've had discussions with them as early as this week. And although the conversations were temporarily disrupted by the pandemic, they, they have resumed. They did resume in early August. And we have been in contact with the Director of Behavioral Health Services, Dr. Suzanne Tavano, and she is committed in assisting us with this endeavor and assigning personnel from behavioral health services as needed. Um, the chiefs of the participating agencies we will be meeting again soon and we look forward to moving this project forward uh, starting uh, as soon as the, the next few weeks. Next. I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some of the expanded uh, non-lethal options for our police department. Uh, you've, I think you've all heard of the BOLA wrap so uh, I wanna share a little bit about that. That was an item that we purchased in June of this year. We purchased two of these items and they're being carried by trained members of our defensive tactics team. So in July, the defensive tactics team provided a demonstration of this device to all sworn members of the department. So they are familiar with its function and applicability. The bowler wrap, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a handheld mobile restraint device, which shoots an eight foot Kevlar cord with hooks on each end. And the idea is for this cord to wrap around and entangle a subject temporarily limiting their mobility. So the idea is to wrap around their legs or their torso and lock their arms, uh, limit their mobility so an officer can move in and get them in handcuffs if, if that's what's needed. The, this device, since we've been carrying it in June, has been requested numerous times, uh, but it has not yet been deployed in a real life scenario. It is currently in its testing and evaluation phase while we determine whether or not to make a larger purchase for the entire department. The second item uh, of discussion on the non-lethal options is beanbag shotguns. In June of this year, we purchased an additional 33 beanbag shotguns with the idea of having one in every marked police vehicle and also having them available for specialty units like our detective bureau when they're out serving search warrants and so forth. Prior to these, this purchase of the additional uh, 33 beanbag shotguns, they were carried only in the supervisor's vehicle and had to be specifically requested. Now they will be readily available to all officers when they are needed and ready for a quick deployment. The last item on this slide is uh, the enhanced tasers and, uh, and body-worn cameras. So 
a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was on September 1st, the council approved a new contract with Taser or with Axon, which is the maker of Taser. And part of that package is new Taser devices as well as a new body worn camera system. I want to talk a little bit about the Taser 7, which is their newest uh, Taser device. Uh, the benefits of that is it shoots a straighter and faster cartridge with better clothing penetration for enhanced success rate. As you probably heard us talk about before, the Taser uh, does not have a, a super high success rate, but it is prone to, to malfunction uh, if both probes don't penetrate. This one uh, is has a lot higher success rate of penetration, shoots a lot straighter, and does penetrate clothing a lot better. In addition, it allows for two cartridges to be installed at one time instead of one. Uh, with the previous Taser, you had one shot at it. If it was unsuccessful, uh, you had to alternate to a, to a different uh, weapon. The other advantage of the Taser 7 is it comes with a simulation training suit, which is provided to assist in realistic scenarios of moving subjects. Prior to this, we, when we have Taser training uh, annually, we shoot at a stationary object. Uh, but with this suit, we'll be able to simulate real life scenarios and have officers practice on actual moving subjects. In addition, uh, as part of this package, they are providing us with empathy training scenarios with a virtual reality headset. So we've already got these headsets to try out. It is, uh, you've seen virtual reality goggles. That's what this is with preloaded scenarios of a variety of subjects of people experiencing different mental health crisis scenarios. And so it walks the officer through these empathy training scenarios with virtual reality goggles. So it's a really enhanced uh, training environment for, for our officers. Uh, oh, and the last one on here is body-worn cameras. Uh, so with this package, the body-worn cameras have improved audio and video, much improved over what we're using now. They have extended, extended buffering up to two minutes. Our current body-worn cameras buffer for 30 seconds. So if you forgot to turn your camera on, it's always recording. And when you turn it on, it goes back 30 seconds. Uh, and with these new cameras, it goes back to as, as far as two minutes. Uh, so that's a significant increase in buffering time. They also have an extended battery life up to 12 hours, which is uh, what we need since our officers work 12 hour shifts. And one of the real benefits of the body worn cameras is a new signal technology, which automatically activates the camera and prevents user error. If an officer is getting out of the car rapidly or responding to a, a rapidly evolving incident and forgets to turn on, turn on the camera. Uh, this activation or signal technology automatically turns on the body-worn camera if the lights uh, are activated in the patrol car, if the rifle is removed from the holster or from the, uh, from the mount in the patrol vehicle, if the taser or firearm is removed from a holster. And also what's a really neat feature about it is if there's multiple officers on scene and it detects multiple officers within 30 feet, it automatically will turn on everybody's body-worn camera. So it's got some really great features of signal technology uh, that we think will be really beneficial to us. Next. Uh, something else that we're really proud of uh, is the Police Chief's Community Advisory Board. And back in January of this year, Chief Chaplin solicited interest from the community to participate in a Chief's Advisory Board. And we were pleased that more than 70 members of the community applied for, and ultimately 16 members were chosen by a panel consisting of the police chief, a member of the community, and a city staff member. The members uh, of this board were chosen as a result of a varied representation from the, throughout the community to include physical location. We wanted to make sure we had representatives from different neighborhoods throughout the city, as well as diversity of thought. The chief is very explicit that he was not looking for people that agreed with him on all topics. He's not looking for an echo chamber. He wanted that diversity of ideas, uh, political ideations, and thought, and so the, the members were selected based on that. The goal of this advisory committee is to serve as a resource for the police chief in forming strategies, furthering community policing, and increasing public awareness regard, regarding policy issues. Uh, in addition, they serve as a sounding board for the chief to provide insight on topics of national and local concern. Uh, the advisory board held its first meeting in February of this year, and at that meeting, they identified a variety of topics for discussions for the remainder of the year. And this board has been meeting every month uh, since February. Next. 
the last slide that I'm going to talk on is the independent investigation of officer involved shooting. We've heard about this request uh, on a couple of occasions tonight. And uh, while the city is confident that the district attorney's office is able to provide an unbiased independent investigation, the police chief and the district attorney have agreed to seek additional review from the state attorney general's office at the conclusion of the district attorney's review. Uh, the police department is also prepared to release all of our internal documents that we are legally uh, authorized to release. Uh, we're ready to do that at the conclusion of the DA's review. And uh, we're hoping to have that soon. I, I don't have a, a definitive date on when we are to expect the DA to conclude their investigation and provide us with a report. Uh, we are hopeful that we will get it in the next uh, month or so, but uh, we have been assured that we should see it by the end of this year. So as soon as we get that, we're anxious to release our internal information as well as make that request to the state attorney general for an independent uh, review. And with that, I will now turn it over to Executive Lieutenant Reese to talk about uh, the next slide. Thank you, Captain Hill. Uh, good evening. Madam Mayor, member of council, my name is Tracy Reese and I'm a Lieutenant with the police department. Uh, so this next part of the presentation, we're gonna discuss the police department's evaluation of our use of force policy. So I just wanna take a, a quick moment to provide you with a brief overview of how our policies are updated. Um, because policies and training mandates are continuously changing uh, due to legislative uh, updates or uh, changes in best practices, we use a company by the name of Lexapol to help manage our uh, policy manual. Uh, that way we're really you know, ensuring, ensuring that we are in compliance. Uh, Lexapol develops policies that are written by subject matter experts and then are reviewed by attorneys prior to giving us the uh, new updates. This really ensures that our policies are always up to date and based on best practices uh, as well as state and federal laws. So our use of force policy has gone through this extensive part process and of note, uh, just in July and August of 2020, our use of force policy was updated because of some different uh, legislative actions uh, that impacted its content. Um, as mentioned earlier, California SB 230 now requires that agencies maintain a policy that provides guidelines to use of force policies. So for example, uh, utilizing de-escalation techniques, um, alternatives to force when feasible, application of deadly force, um, and evaluating uh, all use of forces incidents. Uh, the legislation also requires that agencies um, implement certain training related to these requirements. So we have since evaluated our use of force policy and all of these requirements are reflected in our policy. Uh, so in essence, this action is completed, um, however, uh, policies, you know, they're really a living document uh, and that they're constantly changing, um, you know, based on best practices and changes in law. So for now, this action has been completed. Uh, so moving on. So as part of the use of force policy review, the police department evaluated and responded to the eight can't wait campaign recommendations back on June 9th. Uh, this action item is also completed. Uh, we found that during this review that several of the recommendations outlined in the Eight Can't Wait campaign have been captured in California statute and are already incorporated in our policy manual. Um, you know, ultimately, we found that the police department's policies align with five of the eight recommendations. Uh, we have since shared this with the community, and it's currently on our re website as well as attached to this agenda report uh, for further review. So uh, moving on, as part of our policy review um, of our use force policy, on June 9th, Chief Chaplin announced that uh, effective immediately that the police department would no longer authorize the use of carotid control holds by officers. Uh, so this action item has also been completed. Uh, the last item, uh, the Chief's Advisory Board Committee has recently submitted six different policy recommendations for our use of force policy. Uh, these recommendations are uh, under review for consideration. Uh, however, we have since found that many of these recommendations are already in our use of force policy. Uh, the citizen, our community advisory board based their recommendations from a policy that was dated in July 
Uh, and since this time, we've had two subsequent updates to our policy. So uh, many of these um, suggestions have already been reflected in our policy manual. Uh, however, you know, we're still reviewing these recommendations and we'll re be reporting back to the uh, Community Advisory Board on our decisions uh, here in the very near future. Uh, so this um, action item is still ongoing. That finishes up this part of the presentation. And I believe next is Assistant City Manager Terry, Gil Terry Kilgore. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Mayor and Council, I'd like to speak with you this evening first about the community listening sessions. In September of last year, the city was first approached by the FOSAF group uh, about an idea of creating a safe space for community dialogue. Um, and immediately the city recognized that this was a, a really important idea. Um, and we jumped in to, to begin brainstorming with FOSAF what that would look like, um, how it might m be most effective in our community to really create productive dialogue that could be then translated into uh, meaningful actions in both our city and in our community. Uh, we began meeting in earnest in mid-October of last year, and the initial thinking was that this would be a large public in-person gathering um, with kind of an, a, an openness to, you know, whoever wanted to attend. Um, and over time, as we started to dig deeper into how the sessions would work and how we could really best get people in a space that they felt comfortable talking to each other that were maybe not of the same mind as them, um, it became clear that we needed some expert guidance um, and we needed to reach out into industry to find folks who, who did this for a living. Um, as a group of government officials, this isn't really our specialty. Um, and, uh, and while our community members in FOSAF had great ideas, it was also not their bailiwick. So we partnered together um, to issue an RFP in January of 2020. Uh, which right now feels like forever ago. Um, and our goal had been to hold the listening sessions in March to April of this year. Uh, we got seven responses to that RFP uh, and then COVID hit. And, and that seems to be a, a common refrain um, as you hear us talking about our progress this evening. Um, obviously everyone has been distracted by COVID, but we reconvened in um, July of this year and FOSAF, subcommittee on the listening sessions partnered with city staff to jointly interview and select a consultant. Um, and that part of that dialogue was around, can you facilitate a session or sessions like these in this new virtual world? Um, you know, how can we pivot um, into using the technology available to us? Um, does that create barriers that are going to be um, insurmountable. And, and the reassurance that we got was, no, it's not insurmountable. Um, it's going to require some really creative use of technology. And the other suggestion was to really look at how we craft these groups um, of listening session attendees so that we have people who really feel safe, especially in a digital environment, speaking frankly and honestly, um, and providing deep feedback for consideration. I would note that the subcommittee makeup has shifted over time, um, but and COVID obviously intervened, but never has the city's commitment to go forward and work collaboratively on this topic wavered. Um, I, I personally have been in attendance of many of these meetings, as has our communications manager, Betsy Burkhart, um, and this council has actually provided funding that will help um, make these efforts and this consultant a reality. So the work begins this month. We finally have the consultants um, on board and through the, the contracting gauntlet. Um, you might note that we had a typo um, in our staff report that said we were starting work in September of 2019. Obviously we meant 2020. Um, so we're beginning work there. Um, the consultant's going to work with us to host these online community listening sessions in October, November, December of this year. Um, we're estimating six to 10 sessions based on different um, elements of focus. And then the goal is to have the consultant re report back to the full council in January of 2021. So work is well underway. Um, I would say on a, on a personal level, I have very much um, 
appreciated the depth of thought um, that our community members have brought to this discussion um, in seeking to really find a way to create sessions that will um, be meaningful um, and be frank. Um, so many thanks to our community members on the FOSAF subcommittee who have participated in this process. So shifting gears slightly, um, I wanna to talk to you about the diversity and inclusion task force. Next slide, please. Um, so this task force stems from community input, both from public comment over the last year, um, as well as in the wake of um, the George Floyd killing. Um, the mayor and city council on July 7th established this task force and um, created a framework for how this task force will be structured. Um, the same consultant will be facilitating our task force efforts, our, which includes the selection of members, as well as um, facilitating the meetings, gathering the input and recommendations from the task force, and we'll be reporting back to the full council in early 2021 uh, with both some short-term as well as long-range goals and objectives the city should undertake to um, to broaden people's um, feeling of, of inclusion, um, as well as building additional diversity and, um, and, and making sure that our policies and practices really support people feeling welcome and included. Um, you know, I, the consultant used a phrase that really resonated with me that was, um, much of our work should focus on belonging and dignity. And I, I think those will be um, key cornerstones of the discussion that you will hear in the in coming months. Um, I would note that the, the scope of the task force is broader than that of the listening sessions. Um, the listening sessions are, are specifically earmarked towards mental health, police response and race um, as those three um, have, have manifested and grown as topics in our community and nationally. Whereas the diversity and inclusion task force may um, seek to talk about other things um, and other ways that we can be diverse and inclusive. So more to follow on that. The task force itself is two city council members um, already identified as council member Wilk and council member Francois, um, several city staff, as well as uh, a majority makeup from the Walnut Creek community. And we'll be um, kicking off those um, recruitment processes to participate in the task force for the community um, here in the next month or so. So with that, I would um, pass it back to, count to city manager, Dan Buckshy to talk more about our overall training efforts. Next slide, please. All right, we're in the home stretch here. This is the last slide that uh, we have to present. We want to talk about the training that is planned. And, uh, you know, one thing I want to point out overall, as your council is, is painfully aware, during the budget process this summer, your council had to identify uh, $12 million of budget solutions to close a $12 million gap, which primarily consisted of budget expenditure reductions. Uh, that said, your council allocated $600,000 towards these, these initiatives in order to support those. And as you can see here, 500000 of that 600000 is for training. And so your council did that this July when the budget was adopted. Uh, as part of that, our police department will be receiving additional implicit bias training. Uh, we're targeting by the end of this calendar year. And then we're also looking to have additional mental health training for our police department uh, by the end of the calendar or by the end of the fiscal year, which is for us the end of uh, June 2021. And again, that implicit bias training and the additional mental health response training is additional to what is already done. And then the last item you can see here is not specific to the police department, but applies to all city employees. We have about 360 employees at any given point in time. And we began doing implicit bias training in 2018. And it was our plan to work on a strategic training plan here as part of this uh, budget cycle that was recently completed 
And as uh, has become a common theme, unfortunately, that was slowed down and derailed a bit as a result of COVID. But importantly, the money has been carved out and now we are working on putting those plans in place and we want to have a, you know, all staff trained on at least some of these areas by the end of June and if not all. And I wanna emphasize those areas include implicit bias, diversity and inclusion, and also you'll note there human trafficking as we believe this closely relates to these other matters as there are often many children, uh, many females, and oftentimes many immigrants who are caught up in, uh, in a human trafficking ring, which is absolutely tragic. And so because we do have hundreds of employees that are out and about in the community, we want to make sure our employees are trained so that they have a special eye towards identifying potential situations that might be right before us where somebody is being trafficked and is in a role that uh, they are being forced to do. So that is all the training uh, that we have. And that does conclude our overview of the nine major subject areas that we've been working on. And before I wrap up, as your council knows, but I think bears repeating, this has been an absolute priority for your council, for staff, for the city overall, uh, only possibly outdone by COVID-19 and the response to the pandemic, but the two hand in hand have been by far the two major work efforts over the course of this past year. And with that, we are available to answer any questions your council may have. Thank you very much, um, all of the presenters. I am going to ask city council if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Well, Mayor Pro Tem. Great, thank you. Um, I didn't know we were gonna get that as quickly as we did. So uh, when do we expect to receive the DA's report? You wanna tackle that one, Jay? Sure. Uh, the last I heard, I know the chief chaplain met with the DA, Dina Becton, and had a conversation on that topic. She assured him that we would get it no later than the end of this year, uh, but we are hopeful that we will receive it prior to that. Uh, they do have a order. They go in order that they were received, and there is still a few reports that are ahead of ours in line. Um, but the, the end of the year is one that's been promised by, but we're hopeful that it will be sooner than that. Thank you. Hope, hopefully on the earlier slide, but we've been hoping for that for over a year. I hope so. Um, all right. I got a couple of questions. I think we've we've addressed some of this in previous meetings, but I just want to go over this again. Uh, for the benefit of anybody that either wasn't in the meeting before or those that um, may not have been aware or have forgotten. But what specific areas in the, in the many discussions that we've had with, Foth, with FOSAF has the city not been able to agree to and why? Yeah, they're uh, primarily one area and somewhat of a, a second area, if you will. The first is about um, what should be done with the officers that were involved in the shooting. Uh, the early, initial request from the FOSAF were group that were all five should be fired, <clears throat> should be fired immediately. The second request was that the two officers that fired their handguns should be um, terminated. Then the request shifted that all officers should be removed from active duty and put on admin leave. And then it shifted a bit that uh, they should be redirected to other work. Uh, we simply don't agree with that from the standpoint that the officers have due process and that, uh, you know, there is a DA report, there is a DA's investigation that is pending that is looking into these various matters. In addition, the district attorney's office did a preliminary review within a couple weeks of the incident and cleared the officers to return, at which point they did it various Time frames that did not, <clears throat> excuse me, all return immediately, but they did uh, within a time frame of several weeks to uh, over a month or two in some cases before they returned to active duty. So that's the primary area in which uh, we have not reached agreement about how to proceed. That said, with respect to the investigation, uh, which is somewhat related, obviously, we were waiting for the district attorney's report. The police chief has agreed with the district attorney that upon the completion and publication of that report, if there are members of the community that believe that there should be an additional review, the DA and our police chief have agreed to 
send a letter and make a formal request of the state attorney general to conduct a review of the incident in order to uh, reconsider it at their discretion. The other area that we haven't delved into a lot, a lot of detail, it's morphed a bit over time, but it's the use of force. Uh, more specifically, it's not exactly clear what the specific demands are from FOSAP in terms of what changes they'd like to see for uses of force. That said, we have been addressing that issue, as you can you know, obviously heard in this report. We have invested heavily in more non-lethal means to deal with uh, individuals who are in a mental health crisis or any other type of situation that would warrant de-escalation in an attempt to use non-lethal methods before moving to lethal methods. And I would highlight that in this particular incident, the beanbag shotgun was used. Uh, it was deployed three times. Mr. Hall was struck three times by the non-lethal beanbags, um, but it did not uh, deter him uh, in where he was headed at that point in time. So that is an area in which we're not at 100% agreement, but we've been more focused on some of these other areas. And obviously the changes to our use of force policy and in addition, the non-lethal weapons and methods that are available, we are working on those. Okay, thanks. So you, you'd mentioned investigations um, and we hear a lot about an independent investigation. Is, an in, is the state attorney general's investigation generally considered an independent investigation? Yeah, I wanna clear, oh, go ahead, Steve, if you wanna address that. Yes, it would be it would be an independent investigation conducted under the authority and under the discretion of the attorney general's office. And what else is considered an independent investigation? Um, some some folks have indicated um, that you could go out and hire a separate investigator to do a review of an incident. So it'd be a private uh, a private party. That would do that type of work. And who typically would pay for the private party? Uh, well, it's it's more typical that it's done the way that we do it now with the with either um, like the DA's office or another law enforcement agency. Um, but if you hired a private entity to do it, then it would generally be paid for by the city under those circumstances. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, if I could just uh, add to that briefly, I do want to clarify that the district attorney is not part of the police department. They are independent of all police departments, and the district attorney is elected directly by the people and is not under the purview of the County Board of Supervisors and are only held accountable to the electorate. So it is believed that they are an independent reviewer and their investigation would be independent. However, because we have heard from members of the community that believe that's not the case and that they would be biased in their findings, we have agreed to request that the state attorney general conduct an additional review. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. What area, so uh, Lieutenant Reese had mentioned that we have agreed to five out of the eight, eight can't wait. Uh, what ha areas have we not agreed to and why not? Thank you for the question. So the three that we have not, <clears throat> excuse me, our policies are not aligned with is the ban on the shooting at moving vehicles. So our policy uh, does not explicitly state that we cannot shoot at a moving vehicle. Uh, this recommendation is that it would it would say that. Uh, the second recommendation that we are not in alignment with is on requiring the use of force continuum. Uh, we feel as though the use of force continuum is really a kind of an out, uh, outdated theory on use of force, and we do not feel as though it would be um, uh, the best interest of the community or our officers to go back to a use of force continuum. Uh, the last uh, recommendation is require officers to exhaust all means uh, before shooting. Um, our policy, it, it doesn't explicitly say that. Uh, however, there are different requirements before using, um, you know, before shooting your, your handgun or using um, lethal force. So our policy does not uh, state that you have to exhaust all uh, methods, um, but it does give 
guidelines as to when obviously lethal force can be used. So there's just too many incidents that could occur where an officer could be encounter somebody, say hypothetically with a handgun, um, the officer should not have to resort to other means to thwart a, a threat of somebody with a, a handgun. So that is why the police department, we have not um, considered that recommendation either. And uh, thank you for that explanation, um, Tracy. Could you also, so regarding the shooting at a moving vehicle, why would that be one that's not agreed to? So we, we do, our policy does say that uh, you should consider alternatives prior to shooting at a, a moving vehicle, uh, except, but for our policy, it allows an exception and that is in life threatening situations. So the recommendation is to, uh, it, it is a, you shall not shoot at a moving vehicle. Our policy states that uh, expressly states that you can shoot at a, a vehicle only in life-threatening circumstances. Uh, the policy states that when feasible, officers should take reasonable steps to move out of the path of an approaching vehicle instead of discharging their firearm. And this does go on. Um, however, there are uh, exceptions, and it it's, it says that it, you know, the threat should be imminent and immediate. So, for example, if the vehicle is being used as a weapon of mass destruction or um, you know, perhaps a driver of the occupant is um, you know, firing a handgun from inside of the vehicle or something to that effect. Uh, so there are certain circumstances where a shooting in a moving vehicle may, may be necessary. So it sounds like the eight can't wait are guidelines that are asking for specific yes or no answers. And if there's gray areas in here, it's not, we, we can't necessarily agree to it because there are going to be exceptions. That's, that's what I'm hearing? That's my interpretation of it, yes. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, so Dan, last question. I know we've talked about this before, but again, I think it's worth readdressing, uh, especially in light of this particular agenda item. Uh, when we hear about some of the issues that you had mentioned regarding the police um, officers themselves who were involved in the shooting, is the council allowed by law to make any suggestions on directions on personnel, police or otherwise, that has to do with firing, hiring, layoffs, furloughs, or even desk duty? Your city council only has jurisdiction over um, two employees within the city, both of whom are on this call at the moment. That's the city attorney and myself. Uh, the rest uh, rest with either uh, the department heads or me. And so those decisions rest on the city management's hands, not on the council's. Yeah, and in the police departments, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, those are my questions. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Council Member Silva. Thank you. Um, before we um, thank you for the responses to the questions, and I appreciate the questions that the mayor pro tem asked. Um, continuing on the one question, there um, there are two types of cities. There are charter cities and there are general law cities. We are a general law city, so our authority as a council really comes from general law in the state of California. Is that correct? That is correct. So there may be other cities in the state, probably a third of them that are charter cities where the voters decide to change the charter or establish the charter, which basically establishes the authority of the council as well, or it can. That, that is correct to the extent that the state has not superseded even charter authority, which is much more limited than in a general law city. So it's not like to, uh, the first meeting in October, we could decide to change our our authority and just suddenly on a five to one or four, uh, five, five to one, let's add to the council, five to one, make a six member of council um, on a vote of the council, just suddenly change our authority. Am I correct in that assumption? That's correct. Um, Dan, a couple of questions about the mobile crisis response P team, non PD response, um, you talked about the programs that you and the other city managers looked at that are um, nationally known model programs and also what the county 
also was aware of. And I think he used the phrase, in all cases, none are an immediate response to, and can you clarify that? Because there seems to be, I, I don't know, it, that is interesting news. Yeah, uh, happy to clarify that. So what our research has shown and what the county is very aware of is that none of those are a 911 type of response. They are a crisis, but they're responding to something that is less life-threatening, if you will. Now, that's not to say if they happen to be in an area, there might not be an instance where a mobile crisis response team or a similar program in another state or city wouldn't be able to get there quickly if they happen to be close by, but they are not staffed for that type of an immediate response. And in fact, most instances you're looking at an hour or more, uh, depending, or you know, within the afternoon, something like that for a type of a response to get to somebody. And if somebody is escalated to the point where they are a danger or a potential danger, that is going to be a 911 call that's going to respond result in law enforcement being dispatched. And so that is as part of the outreach piece that we intend to do with stakeholders. Not only are we going to be soliciting input from uh, those stakeholders, we also intend to share how these programs actually work. And so that we can have a dialogue to state, here's what's working in other areas, here are best practices, but here's, here's what this really means and then solicit input about how to appropriately craft a program for Contra Costa County. So, and, and that is consistent with what you all reported with the reading I've done about the program in Lane County, Eugene Springfield, which is not a single city program. It is a regional program um, encompassing two cities, both larger than we are and a rather rural area that surrounds them. But, um, it seems what you're really, I think I can interpret what you're saying is that it's not just the amount of staffing available, it's also the type of call. That's correct. So just adding more social workers and caseworkers would not necessarily mean that at any and every call would receive the um, a non-PD response, that they're yeah, that's correct. And that's, you know, the way we're viewing at this point, and obviously there's a lot of work yet to be done, is that it's not an, an either or. And so if you look at tonight's um, presentation that we shared, I gave an update on the work being done for a non-law enforcement response. Captain Hill gave an update on the additional crisis intervention training we want to do for officers in the region so that they would complement one another. They're not competing, they would complement because there are some situations that uh, an individual may be in a mental health crisis or some other type that warrants a PD response. And other situations that a social worker or a mental health clinician would be the better option. And again, it really comes down to how do you triage that situation, that call, who, who makes that decision, then ultimately who is dispatched to the event and in what time frame? And I, I really appreciate it. I'm glad that you are leading this through the city managers because you were a former county administrator. So you have a direct experience with the, this type of program in San Luis Obispo County. So thank you. Um, my last question, I think will go to Terry. And um, you mentioned that we will start the recruitment for the diversion, diversity and inclusion just like combine two words, like smashed them together. Um, in the near term here, how many um, community members are we looking for? And have, knowing that we got 70 applicants for the chief's advisory board, and we had 150 applicants for the fiscal health task force from 2011. How many do you think we are, how many people are we looking to seat? Our, uh, we are looking to see about eight to 10 um, community members, um, and then we'll support that with four to five staff members. Um, it, so uh, that's pending final input from the consultant. Um, they're going to focus first on getting the listening sessions up and running um, and then trying to, to get this going concurrently, but it'll lag just a little bit behind um, getting those listening sessions launched. 
So given um, how the Chief's Advisory Board was recruited and interviewed and selected before COVID, and mm -hmm. I took a number of months just to get from announcing it to actually seeding it. Is this time frame realistic, October to January, for not only recruiting and seeding them, but having meetings? Or am I misinterpreting the word meetings? It's an aggressive time frame. Uh, we've already talked with the consultants about, um, and we structured the contract such that if it does run longer, um, perhaps the task force finds a specific topic they want to have some guest speakers on or they want to dig in on. We've got some contract flexibility, but um, if all goes um, to how we're visioning it, uh, which we think is unlikely because nothing has gone to plan in the last year. Um, but if all goes to our current thinking, we, we hope to be before the council in February. Um, but I would put an asterisk on that of um, depending on how the task force itself gets seated and func decides to function. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome. Um, council member Francois. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you to staff for the comprehensive update. I, I could tell a lot of time and effort went not only into the report, but the PowerPoint, and I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to ask Dan, and I know that it's, uh, it's early in the process of trying to figure out what the programs are going to be, but attending the Mayor's Conference uh, earlier this month, there seemed to be a, that it would that non-law law enforcement response for mental health emergencies would essentially focus on a call, a response, and an immediate response, and then some sort of treatment. And I'm wondering if you can just walk through all those. You, you and Cindy sort of started talking about the call part of it, which I think is complicated in and of itself, but just kind of what the current thinking is, how you're going to delve into looking at other agencies and how they deal with that, and uh, kind of what the next steps are. Sure, and as you noted, a big piece of this is research because a lot of these issues have been ironed out in other areas and to an extent they already have in this county because the mobile response team and the mobile crisis response team already exist. Um, you know, that said, the mobile crisis response team, the program for adults is newer. It's not as well established and it's not as well known throughout the county and in the cities, as well as the response team for youth and families is. So, you know, there are multiple avenues how calls can come in. Uh, they could come in through the direct line to the crisis team uh, at the county, the MCRT, mobile crisis response team. They could come into 211. And in some instances now, uh, one of the changes that we have implemented, and I defer to Captain Hill for more detail, but uh, through multiple discussions with Gigi Crowder of NAMI, uh, we now have various resources, pamphlets, information that we have given to our patrol officers as well as to our dispatch. So that depending upon the situation, the encounter they're at, they can call the mobile crisis response team or they can, uh, as an educational opportunity, if somebody's not in a major crisis, but having some challenges, we can share that information and hopefully get them into the help uh, that, that, that they need. So, you know, that's on the front end, you know, where it goes from there in terms of, you know, how is this structured? How is it governed? Uh, should there be a specific call center for this type of a response? Those are the questions that still need to be vetted. We're looking at the various programs. That's some of the input that we want to seek from stakeholders, particularly those with mental health expertise or expertise in these types of, of programs. So that's really the next step. Uh, and again, the county is well versed in this. They know how these work. Uh, it was unfortunate. I had actually invited the county to speak tonight to give a very similar uh, presentation to what they gave to the mayors uh, 10 days ago, but unfortunately schedule wise, it, it didn't work. You know, I do wanna point out that the same people that are working on this are the same people who are working on COVID-19 and are the same people who for the last couple of weeks have been dealing with air quality issues and providing direction to everyone. So their time is, uh, is in demand right now 
And that said, they have been very accommodating in terms of working with the cities, but unfortunately they were unable to be here tonight. So the, is it fair to say the focus is essentially, will essentially be on the front end on make on trying to ensure that the call is routed to the appropriate service provider to respond? Yeah, and then that uh, the appropriate response is, is completed. One of the things we're not intentionally looking at this point is what happens after that, because that is this is a very large system of care and this could get bogged down. And if you know we think March is too long, we start looking at the overall system. We'll be looking at this for years. Mm -hmm. uh, folks have been trying to um, reform the mental health system for for decades. In fact, there was a, a measure that was passed, Proposition 63 in 2004, that placed an additional income tax on those with earnings over $1 million. And that funding was specific, and it's, it's funded billions and billions of dollars over that time frame throughout the state. That funding was designed specifically to modernize and revolutionize the mental health care system in California, not just to continue what we are doing. So there have been a lot of programs that have come out of this, but that, that just gives you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. And some of the things that uh, um, Director Ross spoke about at the mayor's conference and in discussions we've had, and candidly, I'm familiar with it from my time in working in a county, you know, the, the county jail ends up being the de facto mental health ward, if you will because uh, at least half of those in jail are suffering from some type of a mental health issue. And that's where we start seeing the revolving door. Folks either go to the emergency room, they're taken into jail. In other instances, they are taken, taken into a psychiatric hospital for evaluation, but the capacity simply isn't there. And that has been part of AB 109, which was prison reform that the governor enacted in uh, Governor Brown in, in 2011 was really lessening the state prison population to not have those folks in prison who are there for drug and alcohol abuse issues, for mental health issues, and to seek them treatment. But, you know, this, these are efforts that take, you know, a generation to change. It's not something that just occurs overnight. It's been a priority for the state for close to a decade now. Counties have been working on it. Cities have been working on it. And certainly there have been improvements. The prison population is down. There are many more rehabilitation programs that are available, but candidly, there's just not enough money and there's not enough resources at the state and national level. And therefore uh, counties and cities are often left to fend for themselves, which is the, you know, somewhat of the situation we're in now. So that may be a long answer to your question as to why we are focusing on this initial call out. That's really what our community members have been requesting and demanding. And it's a very similar in nature to the part of the system that community members in other cities are asking for as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's helpful. And I, I appreciate your county experience. I think that's that uh, as council member Silva said, I think will be very valuable as part of this whole equation. Um, to Captain Hill, I had a question too about uh, expanding the police crisis intervention team. And just, I know it was mostly the chiefs um, policy perspective and getting that going, but just broad strokes, what does that entail? Is that a, like a mutual aid type response with where officers are trained in crisis intervention training? So if someone in Concord or Pleasant Hill didn't have someone on staff when that kind of call came in, a Walnut Creek officer would go similar to the SWAT team or, or what's envisioned there? Yeah, that's exactly right. And the SWAT team is exactly something I was going to mention as a comparative you know, analysis. That's uh, we we uh, work with five different agencies to make up a regional SWAT team because we don't have the resources or we don't need those kind of resources individually, but collectively we do. And I think the same applies here. None of us, none of the departments that I mentioned have the volume of calls for service that would warrant an individual team within that agency. We just don't. In Walnut Creek, we have about 250 mental health calls a year. So that's less than one a day. Obviously, we can't have a 24-7 response team available sitting around waiting for less than one call a day. But collectively, we do have the need to have that. So uh, you're exactly right. That's how we envision it as some sort of uh, agreement between our agencies to provide jurisdictional support uh, and have somebody on 24-7 uh, would be the ideal uh, that is specially trained to deal with mental health crises 
all of our officers get mental health training and de-escalation training, um, but these people would have above and beyond additional training to better equip them to handle the sort of crises that we're, we're faced with. And, uh, and the idea is we'd have somebody on and able to respond within those cities at any time. Terrific, thank you. Okay, any other questions? The only question I have is um, when we, are we looking at how, how the communication happens between the ultimate county um, non-police thing um, how do they communicate with police and, and figure out that they need to respond? Does anybody yes, have any I, clue? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good question. And, and yes, that needs to be part of part of this program and, and process, absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I am going to uh, read, read again public comment because there is an additional comment. From, from us. Does any member, if any member of the public wishes to provide pun, com, public comments at this time, please use the raise hand feature. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral comments. The Zoom feed, feed for each speaker will be cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been, uh, have, will be during this item will be posted on the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read to the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, group spokespersons are allotted 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on an item. We trust that everyone will follow this rule at this time, I will um, ask the city clerk if there are members who are um, of the public who would like to provide comments. Bef but before I do that, we understand that there is a group spokesman, Barbara Pennington, who would like to be the 10 minute speaker on behalf of FOSEF. If that is still the case, we will bring, bring far Barbara forward as our speaker first speaker who will be allotted 10 minutes as she is speaking for the entirety of FOSAF. So that means that anybody who is in FOSAF probably should put their hand down and trust Barbara will cover all the points that they wish to be made. I see Barbara, Barbara's hand is still up. Um, I'm assuming that applies to the 10 minutes. So would you bring Barbara forward? Mayor, just clarification, does this mean that anybody associated with the group of FOSAF, this is taking that place? I will refer that, I believe that is correct, but I will refer the question to the city attorney. That is the intent of that provision that the council has, that if they speak on, if, if an individual speaks on behalf of a group, then the other members of that group are essentially not speaking during that time period. Um, it is very um, difficult to sometimes distinguish when folks are speaking on a particular issue on behalf of FOSAF or on behalf of themselves. And so I would encourage the council to, um, you know, look at the number of speakers you have and, and consider them as you go through. Because some people may be speaking about issues other than what FOSAF talks about. Thank you. Welcome, Barbara. Hello. I hope I don't take 10 minutes because I'm tired. I'm sure you all are too. Um, okay. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and council members. My name is Barbara Pennington and I live in Walnut Creek. I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Scott Alexis and Ton Hall, FOSAF. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Tonight, we heard an excellent presentation from Mr. Buckshy, Captain Hill, Ms. Kilgore, and Officer Reese. We want you to hear directly from FOSAF about some of the items that they talked about. And I'm gonna jump right in. Number one, alternatives to law enforcement responses to emergency mental health calls. Thank you, Mayor Haskew, 
for bringing this forward to the mayors in Contra Costa County and for asking them to support the creation of a 24-7 non-police response to mental health crisis calls. OSAF is looking forward to working with Mr. Buckshy and, and the mayor and providing you with resources, applying public pressure when needed, and making sure that the needs of those who live with a mental health condition are placed first and foremost. We feel that the city moved forward with this as a direct result of FOSAF's repeated demands. We are deeply invested in its design and successful implementation. As a courtesy, we ask that you proactively keep us up to date on its prog progress. Number two, adoption of a restrictive use of force policy for the Walnut Creek Police Department. As our elected officials, this is the most important responsibility you have to ensure your policies do not bring harm to your citizens. The, pol the police department needs further policy language changes around de-escalation, a prohibition on all neck restraints and the use of tear gas. Can we trust that the community will be heard is this city council asking the tough questions of the police department about its use of force policies? What we've heard from this council in the past is that all is good because the department has said, our policies already include most of the eight can't wait recommendations. We urge you take personal responsibility for the policies which ensure the safety of your community. Do not shift this responsibility to your police department, city manager and or their respective staff. In these extraordinary times, your community needs you to be our voice. Please get involved. Number three, evidence-based anti-bias, diversity, crisis intervention, and de-escalation training for the Walnut Creek Police Department. Thank you, thank you for setting aside money in these challenging budget times for better training for the police department. It is evident from what happened to Miles and the events a year later during the police response to the protests on June 1st, 2020, that either the existing de-escalation policies and training were inadequate, the police department policies did not broadly require the use of de-escalation procedures or both. According to tonight's reports, the police department continues to invest in crisis intervention and mental health response training. Since Miles' death, the community has been repeatedly assured that its police receive adequate de-escalation and crisis intervention training. We saw again in June 2020 that this is not true. Should we trust again that the upcoming training will be effective? Is anyone on this council personally taking responsibility to see that this training and its implementation will keep your community safe? Number four, implicit bias training and the community listening sessions. We are concerned that the listening sessions and the diversity and inclusion task force are scheduled to take place concurrently rather than sequentially. We recommend conducting the listening sessions first to enable the city to gather input for creating the task force charter goals and membership. According to tonight's reports, the police department is hosting implicit bias training for its staff in December. Why has the police department committed to conduct this training before the listening sessions engagement is completed in January 2021. Further, the agenda report says that the city's human resources department is currently researching training partners and curriculum for citywide training in diversity, inclusion, and implicit bias. And we hope the city council is included in this training. Why is the city pressing forward without waiting to leverage the learnings from the listening sessions or the task force, both scheduled to present their findings in early 2021? In the last few weeks, the FOSAF members who have been working directly with the city to implement the listening sessions have had little or no response from city staff to inquiries about timing. Phone calls are not returned and emails are evasive. This is very uncharacteristic from a usually very responsive city staff. We hope that the upcoming elect election in which incumbents are running and emphasizing their diversity task force involvement is not affecting the city's responsiveness. Number five, officers who shot Miles Hall should be placed on desk duty, 
until the completion of the police department and district attorney's investigations, as the chief of police indicated in his statement of June 2nd, 2019. This request, although reasonable, has been met with strong resistance by city staff. City councils all over the country having their police departments take this action in response to police shootings. The response from our city is we followed our policy. In that policy, however, was a provision that the chief could, at his discretion, decide not to return the officers to active duty. Although policy allowed this, the chief chose not to do so. As to the new policy, it does not restrict the officers returning to active duty before the investigations are complete. Number five, an independent investigation of the June 2nd, 2019 killing of Miles Hall. The agenda report states we're waiting for the district attorney to complete its investigation. With the district attorney, we have asked for the attorney general to review the investigation. Our understanding is that what the attorney general would be doing is not an independent investigation, but a review of the process used by the city and the district attorney investigations and whether the process followed established protocols. This is not an independent investigation. Across all of these items, we would like more transparency and clarity on the budget. We are grateful that in tough budget year, the city has added half a million dollars to support, among other initiatives, citywide implicit bias training, the community listening sessions, and the expansion of the police department's crisis intervention and mental health, resp mental health response training. How is this $500,000 allocated across these initiatives? If the city plans to place these initiatives on its website, can the city demonstrate its transparency by adding the budget and actuals associated with each initiative? In conclusion, Osaf is disappointed in this council's lack of leadership in response to an outcry from its community. We saw significant movement only after George Floyd and the June 1st, 2020, when it became shockingly apparent that the city was lacking in the policies and training needed to protect its citizens. Strong leadership is proactive and transparent, not defensive. It shows a willingness to enthusiastically seize opportunities for improvement. Since Miles' death, we have attended every city council meeting and met many, many times with city council members, city management, and city staff. Most disappointing in most of these interactions is a city council whose usual, usual response was not to listen, but to defend, who suggested to us how we should frame our requests to get changes, instead of insisting on the changes themselves who have repeatedly supported city staff response of we follow policy instead of insisting that the policies be improved and who seem to think that their obligation to make our community safer only begins when the public demand reaches a certain level or when legislation requires that changes be made. Miles was shot in June, 2019. Your obligation began at the moment the trigger was pulled not in September when public outcry became uncomfortable and not in June, 2020 with an election looming and when consequences of inaction and the name of Miles Hall became known nationally. At the June 9th, 2020 city council meeting, the council asked city staff to report back on what would change if a similar incident happened in the next month, just so we can ensure that this won't happen again. And your community rely on all of you to continue to ask this question. On behalf of FOSAF, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Thank you, Barbara. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Gigi Crowder. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm speaking on behalf of the National Alliance of Mental Illness in Contra Costa County, as well as a private citizen in this county and have spent a lot of time in Warner Creek. I have devoted 
a great amount of time in trying to offer solutions to Wana Creek that I thought would be valuable. I've gotten permission from my board at NAMI to do so, to shift some of my attention to creating solutions. That's how I best operate. So I'm really disheartening, disheartened tonight because I thought I was working in a pretty transparent process with trying to come up with solutions, hiring a consultant and, and having the most important piece take place first. When I heard about the diversity task force, I was taken aback because for me to have two individuals who don't visually represent black indigenous people of color, I thought, ugh, odd. But yeah, hire a consultant and sponsor such a group might, might produce some progress in Warner Creek. But now I feel like that whole process has co-opted what was initially put in place that I have been working with both Terry and Betsy and other members of another advocacy group to put in place. It feels like privilege has taken over what could have been great positive outcome for the city of Walnut Creek. Seems like there's another agenda and not the one we were working from. And I just have to say that because I, I don't like wasting my time. I don't like supporting efforts that won't produce the positive outcome. Anyone knows when you're doing diversity work, you start with leadership, get the buy-in from them. So my suggestion is everyone on this city council participates in this training, any kind of training, because you obviously are on the wrong page about really wanting to change and make positive outcomes. Um, excuse me, um, uh, Gigi, do you have anything more to say because you are representing a group and we've established that that gives you a little more time so, well, great. I'll also say something about the non-police response. We want it named after Miles Hall. Just about every city I've gone to have been okay with that. But Walnut Creek has a hesitation. Walnut Creek should be the first city to say, oh, okay, because of what happened, we will name this pilot program once we get the funding after Miles Hall. Also around that, I got a group of really dedicated subject matter experts doing a dual process as the city managers. Who do you think has the skill set? We've already put in place some recommendations of what we'd like to see. We're putting pressure on the county to support the effort as well. So while we have a duplicative uh, process in place makes no sense because I've worked for county, city, government, but it does not give me the skill set needed, nor do I think Dan has the skill set needed to lift up the program that we think needs to be in place. So I don't know why there would be a hesitation to not just work with the groups that have the subject matter expertise. NAMI is spending dollars to support an effort. Why? To save lives, not just in Walnut Creek, but across the county. That's how important it is. Well, I appreciate the fact that you guys wrote the letter and you got the other mayors involved. Now I'm feeling like all this work is being compromised because you're not listening. It feels a little manipulative for me that we're going through all of this. We spoke with Dan just before the mayors and there was no reference to, to the fact that this process is in place. So transparency is something you all need to work on honoring people who have been volunteering for such a long time to make sure there's better outcome for your residents important. And I would love to see individuals understand their skill set and make space for people who do have the skill set because it's not lacking. It's not, I mean, it's lacking here. You don't have it. It's like you're clueless. And I feel very manipulated. And so I did shoot an email off to Bessie. I'm hoping that she can meet with our group and kind of explain. We interviewed Jason and Selena with the hopes that they were doing listening sessions. And no way did I say they had the skill set to do the additional work that you all want to do. So I never, I never voted toward that effort. I, I supported them for the listening session. Diversity work is much broader. Than, 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 than what we signed up for. And doesn't mean they don't have the skills, but that's not what we said. So there's some distrust there on, on my part around the city. Wanna Creek when I thought we were starting to finally get somewhere. It's, it's very disheartening. So I'm done. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Dan H.
Graham, you need to unmute. Okay. Never forget that we live on Bay Miwok land. 67 weeks ago on June 2nd, 2019, Miles Hall, a Walnut Creek son was murdered by the Walnut Creek Police Department. This murder happened in broad daylight and captured on video. Let us all take a moment of silence for 67 seconds to re recognize and reflect on the 67 weeks since the Walnut Creek Police Department murdered Miles Hall. The request for justice had been loud and clear since the murder. I will keep time, 67 seconds for 67 weeks since the murder and no justice. We are starting now. Say his name, Miles Hall. Go to justiceformileshall.org. Black Minds Matter. And then this $100,000 earmarked for the, for the mental health. I don't understand that. That's only 0.4% of the $28 million police budget. Thank you. Lucas Carboni. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi, this is Lucas Carboni. Uh, he, him. I'd like to speak on the matter of the city's decision to return the officers who killed Miles Hall onto the streets um, pretty quickly. I think this decision was a grave mistake and uh, one of the city's justifications for doing so that nearby police departments had a similar policy at the time is not sufficient. Um, the fact that police departments throughout uh, the county have tremendously failed in ensuring adequate police and officer Oversight and accountability is not news. Two wrongs don't make right, and other Contra Costa City's failure to lead doesn't excuse Walnut Creek's failure in this area. I believe the Walnut Creek Police Department must adopt a policy that, at a minimum, automatically puts all officers who kill someone on death's duty until an independent investigation's completion. Uh, secondly, uh, Jan Buckshy said that firing, suspending, or putting on death's duty um, the officers who killed Hall would violate their due process, but I disagree. District attorneys have the power to deny alleged criminals bail when they consider it, when um, they are considered a danger to society, um, which is in line with due process rights under the Constitution. There's no way that a police chief having the power to, at a very minimum, fire or suspend officers, which obviously isn't um, anywhere equivalent to putting someone in jail, um, until an investigation's completion is a violation of due process in any way more egregious than denying bail. Also, since it was brought up, I think it is noting that Coots is directed through 911. Citizens can call 911 in an emergency situation as they've been trained to do their entire lives. And when the emergency is mental health related, it is directed to Cahoots. Furthermore, any hand wringing by the city council about their ability to fire um, Hall's uh, killer saying that only the police chief and city managers uh, can do it doesn't absolve the city council of any more responsibility, in my opinion. Uh, the city council hired the city manager and the city manager hired the police chief and these positions can change at any time if the city council and, and the city manager respectively want to be the case. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank Isabella? You. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Isabella Malay. I'm a voting resident of Walnut Creek and I'm also an alumna of the Walnut Creek Youth Leadership Commission. While I'm not a member of Folk Staff, I would like to express my support as a private citizen for their demands um, and also reiterate a point brought up by an earlier speaker 
that is absolutely necessary that there is um, extreme community involvement and transparency during the hiring process for the new chief of police in Walnut Creek. Um, to have any community input, you know, be restricted to people who aren't working a nine to five job or who aren't students um, is not accessible and is not meeting the ethical moment. Um, I would also like to point out a pattern that I've noticed in both city staff and in city council, where when we have been discussing the protests around police brutality, or as you have said, rising racial tensions, I've noticed several council members and city staff cite the murder of George Floyd um, specifically. And while I think it, it's true that George Floyd did spark, the murder of George Floyd did spark a national movement, I think that to bring his name instead of the name of Miles Hall is to deflect responsibility from the city of Walnut Creek. The Walnut Creek Police Department murdered Miles Hall, a young black man who was not equipped with a deadly weapon and to, and to, to say that this is only happening because of the murder of George Floyd is incredibly disrespectful to the memory of Miles Hall and to the role that Walnut Creek has played directly um, towards the violence against black people in the United States. So I would encourage you to not cite George Floyd, but instead to cite Miles Hall, who Walnut Creek is responsible for the death of. Thank you. Catherine Wally. Hi, good evening, uh, Catherine Wally um, from Living in Walnut Creek. Excuse me. Um, yes, first I'd like to say I'm pleased to hear that the WCPD will no longer allow the use of the carotid restraint. I'd also like to share some concerns I have with two of the different responses to eight can't wait. Item two, require warning by officers before shooting, and item seven, require you. We appear to have an internet glitch. Catherine, can you hear me? Well, how would you know? Um, I am, I would be. Part of hearing cultural competency. Oh, okay. In Here we go. Six, two Californian public health researchers, including one who happens to be a dear friend of mine, Alina Engelman, evaluated a training workshop on domestic violence calls involving deaf and hard of hearing people and found that few police know about the ADA, including the right to an interpreter. This is one more reason why I strongly support a Miles Hall non-police mobile crisis response unit. Penal Code 830, 835A permits officers to use the amount of force that reasonably appears necessary given the facts and totality of the circumstances known to or perceived by the officer at the time of the event. However, it is very common for hearing people who do not know a person who is deaf or perceive a deaf person who is signing or attempting to communicate in a way that does not match with their perception of normal to be uh, threatening or aggressive. In the context of a crisis, this can result in an escalation of force due to an officer's misperception of the situation or failure to understand why a deaf or hard of hearing person is not responding to a verbal warning. Certain types of calls for crisis help, particularly, particularly for those who are more likely to be perceived as a threat when none exists, demand a Miles Hall non-police response. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Joshua Ferrer. Oh, sorry about that. I am uh, here to demand justice for Miles Hall. Uh, it includes the cops who killed Miles are um, not on active duty or put on desk duty, at least until independent investigation is complete. Um, the justification for them returning to desk duty is the same justification that we hear for a lot of what the city does, which is so it's in line with other nearby agencies. But if those agencies have bad policies, which they do, then it shouldn't be emulated here. Um, an investigation hasn't even been started. Um, the district attorneys and the police department have a very close working relationship, and it's the same across the country, and it's the reason why something like 3% of officer-involved fatal shootings results in charges. It's, like, incredibly low, and it's because it's a really close relationship. And it's been 471 days since Miles Hall was killed. 471 days. I, 
even if I wait to that in seconds, I lose my time to speak, right? Um, it's ridiculous that a report hasn't been completed and it's ridiculous that an independent investigation hasn't been started. There's been uh, pretty much zero substantive um, use of force reforms. Um, the one that you keep on mentioning, the carotid chokehold, hadn't been used in five years. You're still allowed to throw tear gas and shoot rubber bullets at unarmed peaceful protesters protesting against police brutality. And I think you really need to examine that. Um, the police budget increased this year while you defunded the arts, you defunded re uh, recreation, you defunded school crisis counselors, school crossing guards, and so much more were defunded. And that's just the facts. Um, the police were given millions of dollars to buy fancy new non-lethal instruments like beanbags, tasers, and bola wraps, millions of dollars. And you're making a big deal of, oh, in these tough envir uh, economic environments, we put $100,000 of seed money um, to a non-police mental health response. $100,000 versus millions, I mean. Um, we're so, and finally, um, we're still waiting for a non-police mobile response to mental health crisis. Uh, and you're basically, the, the police department is saying, oh, there's so little of a problem, well, we can't do it alone. But CAHOOTS handles 20% of 911 calls. You're selecting, oh, it's only 1% but you're just selecting it out of existence. This is a much bigger problem and, and we're only we can do it alone. Next we have Haley Zeiger. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hi, my name is Haley Zeger. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a Walnut Creek resident. Um, I'm really glad to see City Council finally giving a proper update on the actions the city is taking in the wake of the murder of Miles Hall. Um, I firstly want to say how disturbed I am by Dan Bakshai's comment about the escalation of force during the incident. You cannot expect that firing beanbag shotguns to de-escalate a situation involving a person experiencing psychosis or another mental health crisis, implying that lethal shots were warranted because the beanbag rounds failed to de-escalate the situation is a horrific point of view, especially considering that those beanbag shotguns could not, should not have been fired in the first place. Um, moving past that, I think that the progress, progress towards BOSAT's requests um, is very disappointing, honestly. And since these key initiatives should be the very minimum in making Walnut Creek safer for all. Walnut Creek needs a stronger focus on prevention of crime and community health and empowerment instead of throwing police at problems. We just listened to a lengthy presentation on our fantastic Lusher Center that included points on donating to the Lusher Center and its programs. But let's not forget that city council decided to cut funding to the Lusher Center and other arts and recreation programs to give more money to the police department. Councilmember Francois said it himself that the lesser is beneficial to well-being and mental health. So it seems like a no-brainer to me that more funding should go to community assets like the lesser and in addition, a non-police response to mental health issues. Council, you have an opportunity to bring positive change to our community and help bring justice for Miles Hall. I urge you to take responsibility for Miles Hall's murder because there is blood on your hands and to take responsibility in taking steps to ensure that this never happens again by making FOSAT's demands a higher priority to be more transparent during this pro process and imagine a safer, healthier, and more welcoming city. Lucas Hill. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. keep going. Hi. Hi, City Council. It is my opinion that police trainings will never be enough for police to unlearn their violent ways and to treat people experiencing mental health crises with dignity. Police are trigger happy because of their mindset and their training and because our elected officials do not hold them criminally accountable when they kill people. WCPD needs to at least place the police who killed Miles Hall on desk duty and ultimately, DA Becton needs to hold the police criminally accountable. So please do not invest in trainings and playing virtual reality games in hopes that the police will gain enough empathy not to kill people. And rather, please fully invest in a 24-7 mental health response team based off the CAHOOTS model. To do so, Walnut Creek needs to allocate more funding towards a non-police mental health crisis response team. I am not impressed by the $100,000 the city allocated towards this, which is less than half of a percent of the police budget. Police continue killing black and Latino people across the country. 
There are unpaid community members right now in Oakland and Sacramento who have taken it upon themselves to respond to mental health calls to prevent police violence. Yet the city manager brings up one anecdote of a mental health worker dying on a response call. Undoubtedly a tragedy, but overwhelmingly statistically, people with mental illness are victims of violence much more often than they perpetrate violence. Police kill people in mental health crisis day after day. Please stay focused that the most violence is perpetrated by the police, not by civilians experiencing mental health crises. Lastly, Walnut Creek needs a transparent selection process for its next police chief that includes the citizens of Walnut Creek and FOSA. We need a police chief that deeply understands the interconnected issues of police brutality and racism. The citizens should, not, uh, the citizens should be able to ask questions and ensure the candidates are not only internal, but considered from anyone uh, willing to make Walnut Creek Police Department better. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Moxie Marsh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Moxie Marsh. I attend Los Lomas as Miles Hall did. Today, I'm reminded that Miles Hall was murdered well over a year ago. 472 days, 11,328 hours, 679,680 minutes, 40,780,800 seconds have dragged by since Miles Hall was murdered. Imagine for a moment that you don't get to see your child, brother, your friend, or grandchild for 472 days. I have brothers who I didn't talk to for years. I miss that time more than anything in this world. I dread the fact that I will never be able to get that time back. I cannot imagine the pain of having to wake up after not seeing them for 472 days and go on knowing that I will not see them again for the rest of my life. That is terrifying, but it is a reality for our community members. They never asked for that time to be taken away. They simply asked for love and help from their community, but instead they were given violence and apathy. To this day, they stand in the face of indifference from the city council and police department. How can you hear your own community, your neighbors, saying that they are still hurting, that you have not done enough, and then turn back to the public and exclusively tell us how much you have done that is good and how much, how much you have improved, when it clearly it has been shown to you that it is not enough. The Hall family has made their needs very clear and adding more use of force training and more weapons and spending more money during times of public outcry for less use of force and defunding of the police addresses none of anyone's demands. This is a shocking amount of ap apathy to see from the people who are supposed to represent and protect us, all of us, including the Hall family. Justice for Miles Hall, I yield my time. Thank you, next speaker. Adam Neiman. Hello again, uh, my name is Adam Neiman, resident of Walnut Creek, pronouns he, him, his. And um, I wanna start just by thanking you for taking the time to um, reflect um, so thoroughly on, on the progress made so far and the plans moving forward. I found it very helpful and very, uh, for making clear some of the, the, the progress that is on track to be made. I will say that I don't think uh, it's aggressive enough. Um, I would say I, I would encourage both in terms of the actual outcomes of what we're what we're working on, um, as well as the, uh, the the time frame. I understand that this is a really tricky time frame, and I, I uh, it's difficult to ask. But also, it has been o over a year, as people have said, since Miles was shot and killed, and the here urgency from other folks. That's because. Not only has there been a delay in the time since, but there is an urgency because if another, we want to make sure that another person is not killed in the same way, right? We are doing this to try to prevent the loss of another human life. Uh, the other thing that I want to take a moment to to speak about as well is the the fact that Miles Hall's killers are still on the streets and that they're still they are that is one of the primary demands of Fosath. And I, I just want to echo the fact that if, if the Hall family is re requesting that, and, and I understand that if the city council might not have the authority to, but 
I, I would urge Mr. Buckshy to, to reconsider, though I'm sure he's had plenty of time since then, just to think about this because I, I think it is a tragedy and I think that it, that is what any of us would want. Any, if someone killed some of our, a member of our family, we would want to make sure that that person is no longer on the street, uh, able to kill again. And that the reasoning that another community is doing the same thing is not a very compelling reason. So thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Michael Sampson. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Sampson. I'm a resident of downtown Walnut Creek, and I'm also uh, a candidate for city council. Well, here we are. Um, it's been well over a year now since Miles Hall was killed, and we are finally beginning to see modest steps uh, towards progress. Modest steps. There's still a long way to go. Um, and one of the things that's kind of frustrated me is the sense of... Um, I get the sense that people in city council here are, are kind of patting themselves on the back. Uh, giving yourself a lot of credit for the progress that's been made so far. But we have to recognize the progress that has been made so far has been made in spite of the city council, not because of your efforts. It's been made in spite of what you've done. I mean, we've seen that this city council, this local government is able to act uh, quickly when y'all feel that it's urgent, right? Um, so for example, the COVID crisis, we, you know, went super, super fast to kind of rethink what downtown is um, to enable for socially distanced downtown stuff. You, we worked quickly, urgently, um, but with Miles Hall, you stall. Um, so like, for example, the presentation that you guys recently gave to the, the mayor's conference um, for a 24 seven mental health crisis response, that presentation should have taken place a year ago, at least but it clearly wasn't a priority, right? So at this point, we have to recognize that it is, it is too late for anyone on city council to get credit for any progress that's made this year. It's too late, right? Um, no credit should be given to you guys. It should be given to the activists, um, people who have been fighting for this for over a year now. Um, it is only because you responded to intense public scrutiny um, the pressure just became too great. It is not because of your own volition that you did this stuff. It's only because the pressure became too great. Um, so yeah, with that, I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Han Hall. Hello, I just wanted to um, thank you guys for um, putting this us on the agenda tonight. Um, I do appreciate that. And um, also to Luella for the leadership at the mayor's conference. I think that um, your voice, you guys' voice is gonna be very important to move forward. Um, the leadership that needs to happen to get the other mayors to be on board. So we need you guys to be innovative, creative, figure out ways that you guys can make sure they understand that this could have happened in their city. Um, and I also wanna thank all the community members that did speak and to Barbara for representing Post staff. Um, and, I, and hopefully it, it's, it's a little, being a little bit more clear on what, what we've asked for for a year. And that was like they said, like Michael said, we need, we need you guys to, to speak up. And you know, it's like, where were you guys for the, for the last year? And it really does feel that whether you guys are meeting with us 30 times during the year, it took close out all the initiative to make those happen. So it's just, the question is, it's like, we need you guys to, we need the leadership and that's why we need fresh new leadership um, to come in and to make that change and to be innovative and creative. And to, when things are difficult and, um, you know, my son's the one who got murdered. He's the one who got shot that day. And, um, and it just, it was, it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of um, compassion and empathy. Um, I will say that Kevin did take initiative and asked to meet at our house. You know, I feel like he was really the only one who really did take the time. Luella, I met with you and Cindy as well. And you guys. Oh, yeah, yes. Did was, you not, that, did you? That was after, after I screamed at you guys and yelled at you. Four months later so that's all i'm saying um but we do need we need 
leadership to show up? I think it was July. Well, all I know is what it was when I basically got in your faces and screamed and yelled and pouted my, you know, because it was, I was we're, just- We're not, happy. we're not, right. We're not gonna argue timing. Okay, thank you. Rhiannon Priolini. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, I am here today to demand justice for Miles Hall. Um, I'm here to also support the demands of FOSAF. It was sad to see this is going on for so long. It's been over a year and I, I can just see the frustration and it's, it's really sad. Um, I'm a resi resident of Walnut Creek and um, this happened in my backyard and I'm here to use my voice to demand justice for Miles Hall. I am also um, would like to say that we do need the community voice. Um, the community voices do need to be heard in the hiring of the police chief. Um, it needs to be a transparent process. Also, um, I was on the mayor's conference call at the beginning of the month and um, it was nice to see, you know, the, the, the ball getting rolling and it is apparent that there needs to be a lot of, there is still a lot of work to be done. But one thing that stuck out in my mind um, since that call was um, the, not, the sheer numbers that in 2019, there were 105150 calls um, over Contra Costa County and 30% of those calls were youth. So right there, it just goes to show we do need a non-violent, non-police, again, a non-police, non-violent 24-7 mental health crisis response team. Um, everyone's wondering where we're going to get the money from, but um, you guys are giving more money to the police for these for tasers and things that are not necessary. We do need this to happen. Um, Eugene, Oregon is just a little bit bigger than us and they, they're they doing it. Um, I just would like to also say that... Um... Next we have Shiama Clooney. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and wait, let me, okay, now you can see me too. Hello everybody, honorable members of the city council, um, Madam Mayor, members of city staff. Thank you for hearing from me tonight. I'm speaking as an individual who has known um, Tan and Scott for over 25 years and I've had Miles in my home. I remember where he was standing on the stairs in my home and how much I admired how he was growing up at that time. He's about 16 or 15, I think. Um, first, I'd like, to, I'd like to begin by reminding everybody that Tawn Hall's son has been brutally taken from her life. And so if you could please do me the favor of, of, of conducting yourselves with the utmost respect when you're addressing her um, and remembering the fact that her child has been ripped from her life. Um, I would really appreciate that as her close friend. Um, I, I don't want to parse about when um, individuals on the council met with Tan. I know there have been some gestures um, that were appreciated very much um, by Tan and Scott and the family. But the truth is that for over a year, um, friends of this family were meeting um, together and planning how we could talk during our two to three minutes of public comment every two weeks. And then we began asking, imploring you to please put one of our items on an agenda. And it's not lost on us that that, that didn't occur until after George Floyd's death. And that's hurtful. And that's what you're hearing from people is hurt and despair and dismay at the, at the fact that we feel like we were dismissed for over a year by the city council. Um, I wanna point out a few things. Um, $100,000 while a, a, an olive branch is an infinitesimal amount of money for a city to dedicate to a non-police response. Um, it is tantamount to me dedicating $5 um, to an effort uh, that my family wants to undertake. Um, I also want to... 
Next, we have Vivian McHenry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Let me see if I can get to, there we go. Can you hear me or can you see me? Yes, yes. Okay. all of it. Great, super. So, and just excuse me, no makeup or anything. I just honestly, I wasn't even gonna speak tonight, but I'm just, I'm appalled. I'm appalled at how every time you all, particularly you Luella, center your feelings when we are talking about a mom, as Shama said, mm -hmm. who's had her child ripped, ripped from her. I would spend more time talking about this if you hadn't done us all the favor just now of showing to the world how you lack compassion whenever you're put on the spot. You are, all, are defensive. You, most of you, except for I think Kevin and in a nice conversation with Matt, um, have shown complete contempt for us the majority of the year plus. And that is a lot of what you're hearing tonight. It's unacceptable and you show yourselves every time so we don't even have to do it for you. Please don't ever talk to Ton like that again. I just wanna make a couple of facts known because mm -hmm. you all continue to misrepresent the facts, right? Go everyone please right now to policescorecard.org which is uh, um, put together by Campaign mm -hmm. Zero. Go to Walnut Creek and you will there be able to pull down the Lexapol, the pro mm -hmm. cop, very biased Lexapol written police manual, policy manual, and it will show you all of the ways that Walnut Creek is not compliant. Okay. So when you, Tracy, Lieutenant Reese, and Chief Chaplin say that you are compliant, you are not. Okay. And eight can't wait are the minimum, the minimum qualifications and policies for use of force that many departments across the country have adopted. And so if you can't even make, meet that eight minimum, please do not spend your time and waste our time self-congratulating yourselves over how it is two and a half, now suddenly five out of the eight. Eight is the minimum, okay? And I want to please, Dan, I will not allow you to suggest that we were not clear about those officers. You Next, we have Sarah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Sarah. I'm here to demand justice for Miles Hall. I wanna echo what Ms. Clooney just said. It was kind of shocking to hear how you address Tom Hall. Um, I can't really think of any excuse for it. Um, so I will echo her plea to please talk to her with respect. As many people have already said, the cops who killed Miles are still on active duty. Not only should they be fired, they should be charged criminally. Um, an, in an independent investigation has to be started. It's been over a year and it hasn't been started. There's been zero substantive use of force reforms. And even if there were reforms, there are so many studies that show that it doesn't work. You guys need to reallocate your bloated police budgets into the community, into being proactive instead of being overly reactive and using racist methods to go after your community. The police budget increased this year while arts, recreation, school crisis counselors, school crossing guards, and so much more were defunded. The police were given millions of dollars to buy these fancy, neat, non-lethal instruments like beanbags, tasers, and bowler wraps. Non-lethal does not mean not abusive. And I just want to add that we obviously need to hire a new chief. I yield my time. Thank you. Next, we have Jenny Schneider. Can you hear me? Yes, Jenny. Did you guys hide my video? No. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Mayor, listening to you earlier today during the panel and your claims about your efforts for change with mental health, 
were a bit tough for me to hear. You truly showed little or no action towards change with mental health until George Floyd and the election year came up. And I'm wondering if this is a pattern. I found an article from March 6, 2020 titled San Jose Sharks fans attend home games despite public health officials calling for cancellation. As a government official herself, Luella Haskew might have a better understanding of what goes into decisions that affect public health. Haskew asked about her decision to attend the game with her husband, Ralph, and two friends despite the warnings from Santa Clara officials. Haskew brought up her trip to Europe the couple took back in 2001, the month after September 11 terrorist attacks. They are applying the same fearless mindset now. We are not stopping life. My question is, if you were not having to run for re-election this year, would you have still taken that fearless mindset to seek change for mental health with our surrounding communities? Or would have you remain concerned but show no actions? I do also want to say that the, on a side note, the body language and the facial expressions tonight have been incredible. I love that you guys have the gallery view up. Um, I, this is a long night for everybody. So, um, you know, good luck with the rest of this meeting and I yield my time. Kelly Ho. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Kelly Ho. I'm a voting resident living in downtown Walnut Creek. Um, I actually wasn't going to talk today and I'll tell you why um, as I go along with this statement um, or this public comment. I just wanted to echo everything that everybody has said, um, especially regarding the um, comment made towards Ms. Hall. Um, I fully believe that uh, we shouldn't be trying to make uh, comments within uh, other uh, your citizens will the comment but you know that you know teach their own whatever um and i just wanted to, to add that um there's been a lot of instances where city council members have uh talked about um having a police officer show up to um, a mental health crisis uh though i understand why you would think that you know people um need police officers officers to be there you have to understand from a mental health perspective as a person that you know has um gone through a mental health crisis, seeing a police officer there and having police officers threaten to be called um, is not helpful to people with mental health. Um, and you, you know, a lot of you have talked about um, having family members with mental health and you just have to understand like where that, that comes from, from their perspective and having uh, a police officer with their gun, with their um, baton, with their uniform on, okay? Um, and I was gonna go back to uh, what I was gonna say before. Um, you have to understand like how scared we are when we talk to you and when you talk to us with such contempt and look at us with such contempt, um, it makes us not wanna talk to you. And that's why I have told myself that I shouldn't feel this way, but um, as, a, as, as a citizen, but every time I talk to you, I just always like feel so, so upset and mad afterwards. And I know that I'm not the one, the only one that's feeling this way. So I just wanted to, to, to add that in there and, um, that's it. Thank you. Patty Mitchell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Patty Mitchell. I'm a business owner and a homeowner in Walnut Creek in the Larky Park neighborhood. Arguing with a grieving mother is really unbecoming of a leader, a person elected to represent the citizens of Walnut Creek. Um, it's amazing to me how, what gets a reaction and what doesn't. And um, I concur that um, the defensive posture is, is just palpable and the rolling of the eyes and the, <laughs> the faces, it, it, everyone can see it. Um, so uh, we'll just leave that at that. What I really wanted to say is that you have another opportunity to make a positive change in the culture and in the accountability of this city 
The public needs to hear in detail what the recruitment and hiring process will be for the new chief of police. How will the public have a voice, a meaningful voice in this incredibly important critical hire? There are very few positions in this city, including your own, who have as much influence over the culture, the safety, and the lifestyle that people are used to in Walnut Creek. I would implore you to make sure that this recruitment and hiring process is truly transparent, it's inclusive, it's open, it is far reaching, and it has stated clearly articulated principles and decision-making criteria outlined. And I would ask that whoever is recruiting, not just interview the public to say what our ideal chief is, but that the public have a seat at the table. Thank you very much. Next, we have Sarah Valwana. Hi, can you guys hear me? Sarah, can you talk a little louder? Hello. Hello. Can you lean into better? your mic a little bit? Let me try something really quick. How's that? Is that better? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Sara Valbuena. I am a Walnut Creek resident. I'm 15 and a Latina immigrant. I was not planning to speak today, but was driven to speak today when I saw your blatant disrespect to Ton Hall. I'm horrified by how you've treated the matter of the murder of Miles Hall and the situation of police brutality in Walnut Creek. I'm here to demand justice for Miles Hall and I will continue to do so until you give us true justice. I am a 15 year old person and I can see the blatant disrespect of all of you. I really hope you think about this and think about all the people who have talked to you today about how you are treating us. I yield my time, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Curtis Reese. Good evening. Uh, my name is Curtis Reese. Um, I'm, I'm actually running for a seat on city council. Um, so a few days ago, I was listening to a motiva motivational speaker and he was talking about finding your why. Why you get up early in the morning, why you sacrifice for your dream, the reason for doing the hard work to get to where you want to be. And then I think about the Hall family and I'm thinking about their why. Why are they coming to city council meetings on a regular basis? Why are they constantly asking to meet with you? Why are they pushing so hard for this policy change? And from the very beginning, they've had two whys. Number one was justice for their dead son. Number two was ensuring that nobody ever has to suffer through what they suffered through again. I am concerned about what your why is. Are you interested in clearing up some of the ills of the past? Are you interested in quieting the uproar from the community? Do you really care about ensuring that nobody has to suffer through this pain again? That, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that you don't care, but I'm saying that I'm concerned and I wanna know why you are willing to do this stuff. It's not about did you react soon enough? The answer is no. You could have reacted the next day. It would not have been soon enough for that family. And my concern is not so much that you got upset and snapped at Ton. It's more that you didn't snap at the previous 10 people that criticized you harshly. But when Ton, the mother of the dead boy, said something you didn't agree with, you snapped. I think we have to do better. And I think we can. Thank you. Mayor, I don't see any additional raised hands. We do have a hand raised by Shiyama Clooney, but she has already spoken. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna bring it back to council and our job is to accept this. Do we have any council questions or comments?
Uh, yes, Kevin, please. Um, sure, thank, thank you. And I appreciate the comments that we heard. Obviously, people are very, are very, are very passionate about this. And it's understandable why. The tragedy occurred, the halls are without their son, and nothing is going to bring him back. And I think we can all have empathy and, and sympathy for that. Um, and and, and uh, I, I agree with what Curtis just said uh, when he said that things could have happened the next day and that still wasn't soon enough. Because again, unfortunately, death is forever. Um, so with, with that said, I do want to at least talk about the report. Um, and, I'm, and I'm certainly glad, glad to see the report. Uh, and as much as has been done, I think that we've talked a lot about things that have been done outside the purview of the public, and in some cases, even outside the purview of city council, as conversations have occurred, and we hear about them either in closed session or through different committees. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to see a lot of the progress that had been made while we did hear over the course of the last year that nothing has been done. So we can see that these things didn't happen overnight. This is constant progress that has happened. Uh, and it happened as st starting as early as last fall when there were emails, discussions, settings for the police, uh, the chief advisory board, and these have continued through. So while there was still the tragedy, and I will say the, the heinous killing of George Floyd, these, a lot of these steps were in full swing and continuing progression on them even prior to that. And we are now seeing the results of some of those works and now to the point where we actually have some committee that we've been able to finally formulate. Unfortunately, the pandemic did put a, a brakes on a lot of this for the time until we could actually get things up and running again. And that is hugely unfortunate. Um, transparency is key. And I've talked about transparency being key uh, from the very beginning on this. I've always said we need to follow the facts that includes the DA report, wherever it leads. The fact that the DA report is this late, and we've said this before, and I've said this before, it does not do a service to anybody. In fact, it has done a disservice to the city council, to the city of Walnut Creek, to the police, to FOSAF, and to the Hall family. The delay by 18 months of the DA report has done a disservice to everybody because we can't talk about it, we can't act on it, and we can't take next steps based upon it. We're hearing about the end of the year. Okay, that's great. I hope we do hear, we do receive it by the end of the year. Fact is, I've heard that before. I heard the end of last year, and then I heard spring, and then I heard June, and then I heard fall. Now we're hearing end of the year. This has hurt everybody in the city associated with Miles Hall's death. And I hope the DA hears that loud and clear. And regarding the, uh, the police tools now on non-lethal responses, I am glad I've asked for and the council has asked for additional non-lethal responses when police are involved. And I'm encouraged to see that some of these advanced technology non-lethal responses are now part of the Walnut Creek PD toolkit. Um, I'm disappointed that several members from the public feel that these aren't needed, uh, that money shouldn't be spent in these areas, but they don't want lethal force either. If we're not going to have lethal force and we want to minimize that as much as possible, which I am firmly in favor of, then we need to have non-lethal responses that allow the police officers to still do their job without having to fire uh, a, a gun with a bullet, with a, with a steel bullet. So I'm pleased to see non-lethal responses now part, more of them, part of the Walnut Creek toolkit and surely hope that these will take away the tragedy of a future death of somebody. Thank you. Anybody else wanna make comments? Please, Matt. Okay, thank you. I um, well, those were hard and tough hitting comments. I, I think that's probably an understatement. And I'll just put it out there that um, 
I don't serve on the city council for accolades or pats on the back. That's not how I do really anything in my life. I do it out of a sense of service and trying to do the right thing. And um, I appreciate council member Wilkes comments. Uh, I, I am a little surprised not to hear the outrage from some of the members of the of the public about the lack of the DA's report in the 18 months it's taken to reach that conclusion. I, I do accept and share the criticism that things have not moved fast enough here. And I do believe that there's clearly more work to be done, but I also believe in my core and very firmly that our staff has acted in good faith and made substantial progress. So my direction to staff is to continue to move on. And, and I think to move faster than we have moved, I think is imperative. I'd like the listening sessions to be done this year. I'd like an update on the mobile crisis response team by the end of this year. And I would hope because I think this, I know it's an election season too. So I know a lot of the comments that are being made have an element that, it, that we're kind of really just all on stage and everyone's posturing and saying things and that's happening in the background, which I don't think is productive. I think what's productive is to have real conversations about real important issues and try to reach some, some real proactive change. And I don't think that happens when we posture and name call and, and, and call each other out like that. And, I, and you know, each of us are human too. So we all have feelings and you think we sit up here and you can say whatever you want and it doesn't hurt our feelings. Well, it does. And so we're human. And if you see us roll our eyes or scowl or frown, it's because you hit a nerve. And I know that that's probably part of the strategy among certain of the speakers. I don't think it's true among all of them. But again, I'll come back to transparency, right? Um, this is the second or third, uh, second council meeting. We had a council meeting in June after the protests and the officer deployments there where we had, I believe, a seven hour public hearing and a 19 page staff report. So if that's not transparency, I'm not sure what is. That was within two weeks of the incident happening. We made the information available as quickly as we could. We received a complete report from staff on it and we had a seven hour hearing. I don't know how, you, how an entity could be more transparent than that. Here we're receiving a report on the responses to the FOSAP requests. And again, I don't need to take credit for this. I don't need to take credit for the mobile crisis response team to, to answer uh, Mr. Reese's question. My why is to be able to look Scott and Tom eye to eye and say, I can't bring your boy back. And I want to my core, I want to avoid this happening to any other family. You've asked for, the group has asked for five things to happen. We're trying to do with the best that we can on the five things that you asked us to happen. It's not gonna be exactly what the group has asked for, but it will be progress. I don't think it's uh, responding to Ms. Pennington. I, I don't think it's helpful when the group tries to hamstring the city and say, don't do this, don't start that committee, don't have training until you've had the listening sessions that's more delay in my opinion and we've hired the experts and we're elected to do something and i again i agree that we have not acted as quickly as i would have liked here and i'm committed to seeing faster action on this going forward but that means doing things like the things that have been asked for by fosap and one and that large part of that was equity and diversity training i also would refute the comment that the progress only started to happen after George Floyd. I don't believe that's really true at all. I think that there were 18 meetings with the FOSAF group leading up to the RFQ for the facilitator that went out in January. The chief and the DA, I don't have the exact dates done, but I'm pretty sure that happened before George Floyd where the chief and the DA 
agreed to ask the AG to independently review the, our officers already get um, diversity and implicit bias training every two years. So that was scheduled to happen in December of this year. The difference was that when we were faced with a $12 million deficit coming off with a $12 million deficit the year before, we allocated five to $600,000 towards these programs. I know it doesn't seem like enough, and in the grand scheme of things, it's not, but it's a start. And just like the reaching out to the other cities to get the mobile crisis response team is a start. It's not something we as a city can do all, all our, on our own. And if you've heard the calls for service, the calls for service wouldn't justify that. So we wouldn't be doing our job and we'd be, we'd be criticized for taking on and uh, starting a, a new social program where the need wasn't there entirely based on our city. The need is there based on the, the larger community and we've reached out, but that requires buy-in and input from those other community members. So I would challenge all of you to go to Concord and Pleasant Hill and Moraga because those councils need to be convinced this is a priority too. And the county needs to be convinced it's a priority to make it a 24 seven program. The resource exists. It's a, it's a response. It's not a complete response. And that's where there, there's larger societal things that we as a city council cannot solve. And I feel terrible about that, but it's ones that require state and federal involvement too to really address this issue. But we can start working on it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do something. We absolutely should, and we should be moving faster. I, um, I do think um, in terms of the diversity, equity, inclusion committee, that was something the mayor suggested. That was her uh, direction. I wanted to serve on it, Vice Mayor, Wilk wants to serve on it. I don't believe we need to wait for the listening sessions. This is a this is not wasn't a FOSAF request to begin with. It kind of derived from a different set of circumstances and is an issue where we can involve the community in a different way. It's not that the listening sessions can't influence that or be a positive part of that, but I think it's a it's a broader community discussion that admittedly is overdue too, that we should have and that we should move forward together as a community. So Let's see. I think I've addressed most of what I wanted to address. And in terms of the policy, I guess, on the use of force policy, I, I've reviewed the policy. I, I, would, I would also just say to everyone watching that each of us and every member of this staff has given, I. I absolutely believe to my core, as the city manager said earlier, that this issue was a priority for the city. It is, it has been, it will be, it's not going away. And it takes up space, not just when we're here in the council meetings, it takes up space in our households, it takes up space when we're talking to our children, when we're out for runs, when we're in walks through our neighborhoods. It's something that's ever present. So I. This is not an issue that if someone feels that I frowned at them or rolled my eyes, I apologize. But I, I will tell you that this is an issue that I take seriously. And I know each of the, my four colleagues take seriously, that our city manager and our police department staff take seriously, and that we want to see positive progress made. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll go, unless uh, Cindy, uh, great. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into too great of detail. I, I agree with only uh, all but a few uh, you know, side comments from Mr. Francois and Mr. Wilk, but there's a couple of things that I do want to put across. First, of course, thank you for everyone that came out to, to communicate with us tonight. Uh, while your points were very poignant and directed towards us, uh, many of them, uh, or at least some of them, were not unjustified. Uh, one of the questions that was brought up in the meeting that was referenced by multiple conversations this morning was, what do you hope to accomplish in your first 90 days in government? And all of us got a big laugh. I mean, nothing gets done in 90 days in government. And as I passed along before, it's extremely frustrating 
and I, I understand this from a community perspective, but also from a council perspective that we have been sitting here talking about this for so long, for so long, whether it's the DA, which for whatever reason has given us a multitude of dates that have re repetitively changed and we still don't have the report or even getting out a simple, a simple thing that, that I've been requesting for many months, like a project plan with high level dates around what, what is to, to be accomplished. Because as I said before, the staff and the council has dedicated such a significant time and effort and dollars to even get us to the point where we are today. So I, I, I know that uh, there has been, there is very valid complaints, not only from this council, but also from the community on how fast we're moving on this. But I, I do want to thank staff for putting forth the effort to come out with a project plan and to put, uh, put timelines and go through line by line of what has been accomplished in the, the time and money in which we've spent on this. So, you know, we, I've been asking for this for, for a couple of meetings now. So thank you very much for putting that forward. And again, I can't thank enough the public that has repetitively come out and continues to come out to provide public comment on, uh, on this important issue. Do you have anything? Yes. Um, so I will start by thanking the public for being here, but I also wanna thank staff for the time um, you have spent on this. By my calculation, and I'm just trying to spitball it, there have to be at least 15 of you on city staff involved in this and spending probably half your time on it. It, it just, because I know the things that are not getting done that um, would ordinarily be done by this point of time in the year. And tens of thousands of hours, it's easy to calculate it that way. It's also um, having multiple meetings to try to dis discern and synthesize the input that we're getting. But I will say, it, I mean, everyone is frustrated. I hear, I, we're all frustrated. We're frustrated with how long it is taking the district attorney to complete the investigation. The investigation of which, when the release of it, we'll have critical information that tells us what actions need to be taken. And I don't understand it. Mayor Pro Tem mentioned it first. None of us understand why it's taking this long, but it is out of our control. And the suggestion that we can hire an independent investigation, from my perspective, if the DA's information isn't available, there is nothing for an independent investigator to be able to review and investigate because the information is stuck in the DA's office. In terms of, I appreciate the, what everything that staff has done to move this forward. And this started last fall. It didn't start in June. It started last fall. It started with discussions about having listening sessions and putting forth an RFQ to hire a consultant, seven responses, and then we get COVID. COVID has delayed us by at least six months. It has also caused us to have to close things we don't want to close. It caused us to close the Lesher Center, which means that we had to un unfund some things because the revenues from the Lesher Center weren't there. It wasn't because we wanted to fund the police department instead, but we do need to fund a police department first and foremost, because this community wants to feel safe for all first and foremost. I think we can't, um, I, I'm really concerned about the suggestion that we need to design it. We need to fund it, this non um, PD, mental health response. And then we need in what I thought I was hearing was that we need to tell others that this is the solution. And the only way we get a regional response, and that's the only solution to this, is if we collaborate with our colleagues in these other communities to see what they think and what they want to help fund. If we don't collaborate, nothing will happen. 
So this isn't a, a solution that is already cooked that we can walk in and say, hey, we're done, we got it. We, it requires collaboration across this county. That is how we work in counties as cities together and working with the county. So I think we have to keep moving forward on that. And I know it's frustrating that it takes time, but this is this is what it's going this is what it's going to take. Thank you again to staff. So I guess first I feel like I need to make an apology to Tom. Um, I reacted strongly because I thought I had reached out. I I left flowers at your house. I wrote no, a note. I've tried to respond to every cons, um, chance um, of conversation. And I actually am going to admit that, um, bless his heart, um, council member Francois hit it on, hit the nail on the head. My feelings were hurt. Um, we are working hard. I believe the letter that I wrote that, that started the, the mayor's conference and to the, the council, excuse me, to the supervisors was way before the date um, of George Floyd's death. Um, I, I, really, I, I really get frustrated when, when people accuse us of not caring. Um, that is the furthest thing from the truth. We care very deeply. I truly feel like somebody in my family died. I, I, I grieve over what could have been um, and desperately want to carry forward and find ways to prevent it in every case for every time. So I thank the staff. I thank the people who have come here. Um, I, I would like in my mind to think I'm a perfect person. I'm not. And I appreciate that um, sometimes, sometimes it's just hard to sit here and listen and, and understand. Um, but it isn't that we aren't trying, and it certainly isn't that I'm not trying. I believe we have um, one job to do, and that is to accept the report. Move to accept the report. Okay. I have a, all right. We have a first a motion and a second. May I have a roll call vote? Councilmember Waddell? Aye. Councilmember Francois? Aye. Councilmember Silva? Mayor Pro Tem Wilk. Aye. Mayor Haskew. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for getting through this meeting. Uh, we are adjourned as of this moment, and we will see you again at our next regular meeting in October. <laughs>